Welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio, powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGid.com. That's TireGid.com. You have to buy tires from somebody, you might as well buy them from us. Help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I'm your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast. Today we have another incredible family and friends guest, guest episode. The great Troy Hudson is in the studio with us. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is my brother right here. And we're going to talk about, well, we're in the middle of a, on the brink of, in the middle of a war, but on the brink of world war, but we're not going to talk about world war today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit of basketball, mainly because I talk about war and politics every day on the <laughs> podcast. So this is a nice change of pace. And I mean, why say I told you so? You all see what's going on there in the Middle East and around the world. I don't need to say I told you so. Um, we're going we're gonna to be talking about basketball today. And if you don't know, if, if any of you out there don't know, uh, Troy Hudson played in the NBA for 11, ele- 11 years, um, was undrafted. So I'm, I mean, I'm going to let him tell his story, but he was undrafted, which is uh, an incredible feat in and of itself to be undrafted and then have an 11 year career. Not only that, but had an incredible 11 year career. If you're a Minnesota Timberwolves fan, or if you're a fan of the NBA in general, real fan, not a casual fan, not a more recent fan. Uh, you remember some of those uh, iconic games where the Timberwolves went as far as they've gone in, in franchise history. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Troy put on some incredible performances against one of the most storied franchises of the NBA's history, the the Kobe Shaq L.A. Lakers, and got the, uh, the moniker the Laker killer uh, during that time and sc- had a couple 40-point games, a uh, 40-point game, a couple 30-point games. Yeah was was uh was uh putting on one hell of a show in that series. I remember being a kid and, and being uh very excited to see one of our Timberwolf players play so well. So um thanks for being here in the studio. We appreciate it. Uh just tell a little let's start here with a little bit of background. Bring me up to the NBA, the Cliff Notes version, but bring me up to the NBA where you were born, how you came up and, and then we'll we'll go from there. Well uh I am I'm from Carbondale, Illinois, Southern mm-hmm. Illinois. Um five hours south of Chicago. A lot of people tend to when you say you're from Illinois, they just put you in the Chicago yeah. area. But we're five hours south of Chicago, um, about an hour um, northeast of St. Louis, uh, right on the border of Kentucky and Indiana. So, you know, farmland. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really small town. It's a college town, Southern Illinois University. Um, 18 to 20,000 uh, residents, Carbondale residents. And then you have your students. At the time I was going to school, we had about 20,000 students. Right now, it's about 8,000. So it's really went down. Um, so that's Southern Illinois? Yeah, Southern okay. Illinois. Yeah, yeah. mid-major yeah. Uh, college, you know. Uh, but, you know, raised in a small community, um, raised in public housing, um, just really, you know, had to get it out the mud. You know, uh, basketball was one of those one of those um, things that really kept me focused on where did I wanted, what I wanted to be in life. You know, and, and it wasn't always about the NBA. It was just something that, you know, when you're coming from the projects, you know, everything around you is all negativity. So basketball is one of the things I can really escape the the, the poverty aspects of life um, when you're living in, in, yeah. in dire uh, times, right? So, And it's, um, a, it's a cheap sport to play. Very cheap, yeah. yeah. All you need is a ball in, and, a, in an outdoor court. And what's so crazy about that, I didn't even have – sometimes I didn't even have a ball. I had a neighbor who had a, uh, two sons who had a, who had balls. <laughs> right, I right. would go knock on knock her door, on door. Yeah. at 6.30 in the morning every day and, and, and ask could I use the ball. Wow. Shout out to Brenda Moore. Um, you know, she allowed me to, to use that ball all summer long. Wow. Right? It, it got to the point where she was just say, you know what, just come right in. It's right by the door. Grab it, right? So – um. I was able to really, you know, hone my skills um, in a small town. And, and, you know, basketball in Illinois is very rich, uh, especially Southern Illinois. Um, You got Jerry Sloan. You got, um, you know, Rich Heron, who was a a exceptional coach, who became my college coach, but he coached Doug Collins in Benton, Illinois. Um, So you, Walt Frazier, who wasn't from Southern Illinois, but he played in Southern Illinois. So, it's, it's a very rich tradition of basketball. I mean, that's where the original March Madness, the, the moniker March Madness, has mm-hmm. come from the state of Illinois. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very rich in basketball. So um, just being able to look up uh, to some some great basketball players from that area really is what really motivated me to to become the player that I became. Um, you know, so you always got to give you tip your hat off to the ones that came before you. So, um, yeah, the, the long story short, small town kid, 
with big city dreams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And came up, and, and your grandmother was very instrumental in your life, and came up around the church, and you know had had the God aspect in your life as well there in in, in Carbondale. And, oh, definitely. Yeah, and so and you so you go to Southern Illinois. Well, first of all, you played high school there in in, in Southern in Carbondale. Correct. Uh, and then you go to Southern, you didn't go to Southern Illinois first, you went to Missouri. I went to the University of Missouri. Right. Yeah, okay. which was, um, you know, I was one of, in, in 1994, I was probably top 10 recruited players in the country. Okay. Um, and that was 1994. 94, okay. The 1900s. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, was, so. I was three at the time. Just to let you. Let you yeah, in the 1900s. Yeah. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. I had a lot of places. So my, my, my top three was Purdue, Missouri, in Arkansas, and I chose Missouri. It's, it's crazy on how um, marketing and television will influence you mm -hmm. because I wanted to go to Arkansas because I just love the style. I love the 40 Minutes of Hell with Nola Richardson and all those guys, and I loved Missouri as well, but I was able to watch every Missouri home basketball, and away basketball game. So Anthony Peeler, Doug Smith, is the reason why I went to the University of Missouri. I didn't even know why I was going. Wow. I didn't even I didn't even realize their style of play or anything. I just went because I saw them every day on TV, right? Yeah, you liked them as players. Uh, yeah, 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 I liked them as players. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got there and um come to find out they didn't play my style of play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Norm Stewart, old school coach, great coach. I love Norm Stewart, right? Yeah. Great coach, RIP. Um, but he was a more traditional point guard style coach and you were a scoring combo guard before i shot every ball that touched my hand <laughs> right you know okay. what i'm saying right, I, right. you know i just ran around in high school i ran around a bunch of picks and shot threes right mm -hmm. i was just i was just a bucket yeah. so when i got to missouri it was like no bring the ball up fake a pass to make the pass to the in, in, enter into the post mm -hmm. and and wait for your opportunity to knock down an open open shot so i struggled you know so um rather than just fighting through it uh, which sometimes I kind of contemplate to this day on whether I should have fought through it because I think I am where I am and I'm glad I am where I am and I'm glad everything happened the way it did. But if I re rewind it back, I think coming from a, a larger uh, um, conference, which yeah. was the big eight at the time, yeah, where you yeah. played Kansas, you play all those guys, it probably would have took a little longer, maybe in, in year two or three, I probably would have been able to get loose and I think scouts would have really saw my abilities, and I may have got drafted. Right. You know what oh, I'm saying? Yeah, that would definitely go... change whether you get drafted or not. Exactly. So yeah. in um, a bigger program, more television time, more. Especially more... at that time. Yeah, for you know, sure. Nowadays, it don't it don't really matter. Every game's online. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, back then, you know, and then I would have been going against some of the top guards, uh, like a Jacques Vaughn, right? Uh, who I, who I was a rookie with in in camp in Utah, and like a lot of those top guards that came out out of that draft. I end up having better careers then, mm -hmm. just off uh, talent wise. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm knowing being in a bigger conference, I probably would have got drafted. But it is what it is. You know, it taught me a lot, yeah. and I had to I had to get it out the mud and and had to make a way, yeah. the opposite way. Yeah. And so then now you transfer to Carbondale. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not to Carbondale. You transfer well, Carbondale. Yeah. yeah. You transfer to Southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what 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 was that like? Um. Well, going back home. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's a so, lot. A lot come with it. It's a lot come with. It. So when I transferred back home, um, I was actually originally gonna go leave and go to New Mexico State. They wanted me bad, right? I was like just about to sign a letter of intent to New Mexico State. Rich Heron, who was Doug Collins' uh, high school coach, mm. so he's used to a player jacking shots, right? Doug Collins was, right, right. you know, a bucket. So we go into his office. Me and my uncle, my uncle Kim, you know Kim. Yeah, Kim. We go into uh to Rich Heron's office and. We said, we just got one question. To, to change our mind, we got one question. How many times can he shoot? <laughs> he said, anytime he want. And that's, the rest is history. Wow. The rest is history. Wow. And I shot anytime I wanted. <laughs> and you had, you had a great career there at Southern Illinois. You, got, you recently inducted into the Hall of Fame there mm -hmm. yep. at, at Southern Illinois. Um, so congrats on that. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be inducted to any Hall of Fames. <laughs> I'm just too uh, controversial. I thought about it the other day. I'm like, would the Minnesota Basketball Hall of Fame induct me? And probably not. Might be too controversial. Uh, Hopkins, maybe, maybe, probably at yeah, Hopkins. Hopkins, yeah. But I was only there for one season, right? So, yeah, but, hey, but you went undefeated. That's one true. The, yeah. That's true. And I was Mr. Basketball, so maybe there. Right. But I, I would stay too, maybe, yeah. maybe. But I was only there for a season, right. so you know, kind of the tenure. You got to kind of cross that two-year mark 
at least right, right, right. to kind of be, you know, in the fabric of the university. You know, that's why I tell a lot of these one and done kids. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're one and done and you make it big time, like Kevin Durant, right, then yeah. the, the the commercial puts you in the Hall of Fame. Exactly. But if you go one and done and you don't make it, ooh, you're gonna be able to come back to that school, right? But you're not gonna be enshrined in the fabric of the university. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's a that's an interesting little dynamic. But anyway, so you. You go undrafted. So tell me the process of you entering the draft. And so did you enter the draft and then you didn't get drafted? Or did you how, – how did that whole process go? Um, so, yeah, um, I went two years, you know, at the University uh, Southern Illinois University. Did you lose one at Missouri? What's, oh, let me let me give you okay. that back, right? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, let go me ahead. give you that back. Well, back. I'm going to get you a you – want, you, want, you want some McAllen? Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah I'll get you. Keep uh, talking. Right. Keep talking. So – the the crazy thing about this is when I left the University of Missouri, um, it was it's very thin line, fine print at the bottom of your um letter of intent that says that you have to stay an entire year before transferring or you you'll lose two and a half years. So when I left, I could have only had a year and a half to to play basketball. And I hadn't played more than two games at Missouri. So when I actually left, I um, <clears throat> had to get an attorney to go against the uh, NCAA. Um, and, and the attorney was able to um, get them to understand that I had a, a learning disability, right? Oh, okay. And the fact that when I signed my letter of intent with the University of Missouri, no adult was uh, present. Oh, wow. So I signed my letter of intent. No adult was present. So I was able to. That's illegal. That's illegal. And I was able to regain a year and a half back. So it gave me three years to play. And the way we did it was when they found out I was going to be suspended for the, 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 well, not suspended, ineligible for the beginning part of the season in my sophomore year. Because, mm -hmm. you know, usually the beginning part of the season, you will play what? Close to twelve games, yeah. Right before New Year's, yeah. For right, sure. so I couldn't play until after New Year's to the to conference play. To conference play. Mm -hmm. So what Rich Heron did was, he had control of the schedule. So what he did was, he made sure he didn't. He we only played three games <laughs> before the New Year's. Oh, so he tried to Jimmy rig the schedule. He Jimmy rigged the schedule, so we only played three mm -hmm. games. So I pretty much played a full season. I was only supposed to play a half, considering the amount of games you play before conference right but we only played three games so i only missed three games wow so i played one year played the next year and i averaged 22 both years i became the all-time two-year leading scorer in the school's history um passing walt clive fraser the great walt fraser the, the great clive fraser yeah, right yeah. uh and clean dress walt oh Flourish. the best dress uh -huh. ever uh -huh. still to this day to this day um and so what happened is I started seeing myself getting triple team. Like my fr my first year, then my second year, they started triple team and they started face guarding me. Yeah. And I said, you know what? Ain't no more for me to prove here. You know, like I average 22 both years. I'm not going to average no more than 22 the next year because they're on me, right? So I opted out my junior year to go into the draft mm -hmm. against everybody's opinions. You know? So people were telling you not to go. Oh, bro. Um, the, the, the lead guy for the NBA, uh, I forget his name, Marty Blake. Okay. So Marty Blake had a write-up of all your your potential draftees. He said, this kid will never play in the NBA. Wow. He would be lucky if he even has a career overseas. Really? No, this was a, a, the literal write-up. Wow. Like, he will never play in the NBA. He'll be lucky. He's an undersized two-guard, and all he does is shoot. He can't dribble. He's 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 195 pounds. He's two weak for the NBA. This is a little write up, right? So, wow. And I it didn't bother me none yeah, because I mean, you know it, that happens every every season. I, I'm, and and I'm from public housing. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Ain't that you can say <laughs> yeah. to discourage me, right? We played the dozens way worse than that. I right, had yeah. my feelings hurt on the playground you know so much worse. Yeah. Than so, that. and so what happened is I entered the draft, knowing I wasn't gonna get drafted. I remember to this day I was actually on the plane, headed to. Minicamp for the Boston Celtics on draft night. So 
So that lets you know you know you're not getting drafted because you're not going to be headed somewhere in case you get drafted, right? Right. So I get to uh, Boston all summer long. I, I go through all the little mini camps and stuff like that. And mini camps are it's good because it builds your resume. But I had a great agent by the name of Bill Neff who kept it 100 with me. He would let me know, you're not going to make that team. And it wasn't because of uh, talent. Bring that mic a little closer to you. It wasn't because of talent or anything like that. Yeah. He knows the game that I didn't know. The business. The business. Like, they don't have enough money for you. They already got 12 people on the roster with one in the fold. You know what I'm saying? So he knew. And so I remember, I'd be like, dang, that's discouraging. Like, I'm not going to make the team while I'm going. And he was like, you're building a resume. You go show them what you can do. The NBA is one big fraternity. When it's time for you to go to another camp, they're going to tell those people, no, this kid can play. We just didn't have room for him. This kid can play. So what happened was, kept going through that, end up going to Utah Jazz's camp in 97. They're off the, just finished the NBA Finals. Right. This is right. the first year, right? Right. They just finished the NBA Which Finals. Which is good because they got a lot of stars, a lot of veterans. They yes. don't have a lot, a lot of room to go and get top draft picks. Right. The whole, okay. Which they had a top draft pick. Oh, they did? They got Jock Vaughn. Oh, Jock Vaughn. So, wow. they, yeah, Jock Vaughn went lottery. Yeah. So, they had Jock Vaughn, um, who was coming in. He was supposed to be the heir apparent to John Stockton, mm-hmm. which, you know, the way he plays, he's a, a leader. He was, and he, he was that, like, from the, from the get-go. He was all of that, right? So, the, the number one scout for the Utah Jazz, by a guy by the name of David Fredman, is from Southern Illinois. Jerry Sloan. It's from Southern Illinois. Small David world. Fredman and Jerry Sloan were great friends growing up as ch- children, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so Fredman and my college coach, Rich Heron, great friends. And Rich kept telling him, like, he may not get drafted, but he's one of the best guards in the draft. And so he kept telling Fredman that. So Fredman started coming to watch me. And he started coming to watch me. He actually tried to get the Utah Jazz to draft me over Jock. Wow. Yes. But that wouldn't make no sense, right? Yeah. At that time, that wouldn't make no sense. He had too much name, notoriety. All American. Much, yeah. And he could play, right? He could play, yeah. yeah, he wasn't weak. He could play. So, but Fredman knew that I was a different type of talent. Like, mm-hmm. you would have to teach me what Jock knows as far as point guards wise, but mm-hmm. you wouldn't have to teach me to compete and to score the ball and, you know, be a factor. So I go to camp with them and I end up making their. 12 man roster because John Stockton, for the first time in his career, was injured and had to get surgery. Wow. For the first time in his career. Wow. Ever, right? He had never missed games from like nothing wow. like that. And so it was time for them to make a decision on whether they're going to cut me because they had a second round pick by the name of Nate Thurman, um, who was from Oklahoma State, uh, six, six, Four combo guard can handle the ball, athletic, shoot it, and they had picked him second round. At this time, it was unheard of for if there was a slot available, they're gonna give it to their second round pick. Mm-hmm. So they were about to do that. John Stockton walks in the office and say, "You're not cutting Hudson. I don't care what you do." John Stockton. John Stockton. That's your man. That's my man. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> they see how I competed mm-hmm. every day. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I just competed every day. Shout I was, out to shout out to John hey, Stockton. Shout out to John Stockton. I gotta yeah, say yeah. right now, shout out to John yes, Stockton sir. for that uh, number one. But also, the great John Stockton is on the front line. Uh, very controversial, controversial, quote unquote, in some of his political views. More on my side of things. Fought against a lot of what's going on out there in the world. Fought against getting vaccinated. I'm, John, if you're out there, we gotta have you on the pod. Matter of fact, I'm gonna call Kenny Mauer. To call John Stockton, and we're gonna get John and Kenny Mauer in here for a four man podcast. Okay, keep going. Keep yeah, going. so John walked in and he says, Listen, this kid, because I, I was the first person to practice every day, the last to leave. Mm. For, and this is every day. First there, last to leave. We had a a, a shuttle, because at the time, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make the team, so we're standing at a hotel and they're sending in a shuttle to get all the players. I took my per diem money to get a taxi. We didn't have Uber. Um, in the 1900s, so <laughs> I spent my money to get a taxi to, to go get there early to go back and forth. Wow! And and I wanted to make sure that they saw me in the gym before everybody and after everybody, because I mean, Little once things. again, I'm gonna keep saying it. I came from public housing. I wasn't trying to go back. <laughs> right, right. 
Little things, right? Exactly, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you end up, so now you're with the Jazz uh, in, the, in the later stages of that 90s run. So there's Carl Malone's there and and um, Stockton's there. Uh, Hornacek, did you play? Oh, yes, Jeff? Horny. Yes, Horny. Yeah, Jeff, Iowa State. Yes. Okay. Um, Byron Russell? Yes. Still there? Byron was there. Um, Shandon Anderson. Ostertag? Ostertag. Big Greg was there. Um, let me I dunked think. on Big Greg, too. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I caught him. Uh-huh. Caught him, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so that was, that, was a, that was a legendary team. Oh, so. yes. Just a few possessions away from from really upsetting the storied Bulls. I guess not a few possessions. I mean, they they didn't really take them to Game Seven, so right. that was like, their whole but, but, game but, away. But a few possessions we, away from being in Game Seven for sure. No, no, no. We were we were up. Right. No, right. I'm saying we were up two one. Right. right. And 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 Mike gets that. Uh, Mike and Mike just made so many big plays in that that series. Yeah. By himself. Yeah. On defensively and offensively, like. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think we would have went up three, two. If I'm if I'm correct, three two going back to yeah, it would have been three two going back to uh to Salt Lake City, and I would have had a ring that year too. Wow. Yeah, I'd have got a ring. I only played twenty nine games, but that was enough to get a ring if they would have won. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a ring is a ring. You were in practice. Oh, oh definitely. Oh yeah, yeah I was people, there. People every don't day. understand that. I mean, you still got to go to practice every day. You yes. still got to work. You every, still got to get it in every day. Um. So t- so then you end up in what was the next spot? You were in. F- I had to go. No, actually. So after I get cut because John Stockton came back, and at this time they really wasn't. And some teams did, but the Utah Jazz wouldn't keep you on the IR. If you really wasn't hurt, right. right? So some teams kept you on the IR as a way to keep people on in case somebody some, got hurt. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. No, okay. they didn't do it. Some teams did it. Not many. Every team does it now, right? They and, got eighteen you got your, guys on the team. Yeah, now. and you got your two way plays. Yeah. All, yeah. So when he came back, they released me, and I had to go to the CBA, the Continental Basketball Association, which is it's kind of the G League. You know, some of the teams are still around and they're playing in the G League under different names and stuff like that. But the same, you know, like Sioux Falls Sky Force is still the Sky Force. Mm -hmm. And that's where I went to the Yakima Sun Kings because they drafted me that year, um, I think with the second pick in the draft, the CBA draft. They drafted me with the second pick. But then I left there and went to uh, Sioux Falls, uh, which we made, you know, the finals and stuff like, and that was a a grind. Mm -hmm. That The CBA is a, a real, like, we had some teams in the CBA that could have beat some of the the bottom teams in the NBA mm-hmm. in those years. You know, Jimmy King, uh, Doug Smith, um, Stacey King. Like it was some real ballers in the CBA. In the C- at the time. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was it was crazy. Mm-hmm. And so so you end up with um, you end up at the CBA. And where's your next landing spot? Oh, so after the CBA, um, I got a ten day call up. And from Sioux Falls, and I always tell my kids this, my kids in my program, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the kids, even if I'm just training them, it don't matter. I got called up for a ten day contract off the bench. Wow! I was coming off the bench in in the CBA. In the CBA, right? Randy Livingston, great the great Randy Livingston mm-hmm. was our starting point guard. Uh, the great Victor Page was our starting two guard. Um, the Clippers was looking for a point guard to come in because Scott Brooks was hurt, Derek Martin was hurt, Poo Richardson was hurt. Um, wow, there's a name, Poo Richardson. Exactly right. Wow. Um, and so I didn't think I was getting called up. Next thing I know, we're getting ready for the CBA playoffs. We had played our last game. We're all in one of my homeboys' room. We're all chilling the whole team, um, and we're just kicking it, getting ready for. And my agent calls my homeboys' room which we had the same agent. His name is uh, Buck, Monty Buckley. And Buck looks over at me, he say, hey, Huddy. I'm like, yo, what's up? He said, Bill on the phone, bro. You just got called up to the Clippers. I'm like, man, stop playing. Yeah. And Buck, he from Sacktown, you know, he and he's a straight shooter. He like, bro, I'm serious. Yeah. And when he said that, I said, got the phone. My agent said, you got two hours to get on the plane. Damn. You got two hours to get on the plane. We already got your ticket. You got two hours to get on the plane, got on the plane. Actually, I had a navigator. This is the first year of the navigators. I had a big gold navigator. And one of my homies from my hometown was with me in the CBA, staying with me. Mm-hmm. I got back to the room. I said, bro, I said, 
pack of all because ten days. If I got cut in ten days, I'd have to come back to this to this uh, CBA and finish the playoff. I said, bro, I need you to get all my clothes, pack them in my navigator, and drive it to the crib. I ain't coming back. Already had that confidence. Already had confidence. I'm I'm never coming. back. I'm never coming back here again. Yeah. I got my I got another shot. Yeah. I'm never coming back again. We play. I, I land in in L.A. And this is this is so crazy, bro. Cause this is like this is two ninety eight, right? This is ninety eight. I land in L. A. Guess who's waiting for me with a sign? This 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 how far the NBA didn't come. Yeah. Guess who, guess who? Guess who's waiting for me with a sign as if he's a chauffeur? Cause I thought he was until we got to the arena with a sign. Elgin Baylor. <laughs> <laughs> Rest in peace to the great Elgin great Baylor. Elgin ba- hey. For those of you out there who don't know, I mean Elgin Baylor was Kobe Bryant. Oh yes. He was the he was the He was the first person to do Eurostep. He was first that didn't person come from Europe. He was the premier shooting guard yes. in the league before Mike, before Kobe. He was the guy. I mean, Elgin Baylor is Underrated, really. Oh, Under yes. underspoken about in terms oh, of yes. all time lists. He's one of those names that just 60s different. and 50 balls. Oh, different. Like, different. nightly. Yeah. And he's picking you up at the airport. He's picking me up at the airport. With a paper sign. With a sign. With a paper sign. With, even, with Sharpie on it. Not even laminated. <laughs> <laughs> so he's picking me up, and I'm I'm in a car, he's like, hey, I'm Elgin. And, you know, at this time, you know, I should have known who he was, but I really didn't. Yeah, because he played on the 60s. 60s. Yeah. yeah, so I really didn't, you know, because he wasn't, like you said, underrated. Right. Um to 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 America as far as the casual fan, right? Um, but people that know basketball, like right now, I know who he is. Um, but but there's gonna be a lot of people out there who don't know Elgin Baylor is too. If, exactly. I, if I ask Lil Royce who Elgin Baylor is, he'd probably be like, "Who?" Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So he picks me up. We ride all the way to practice. I'm riding with him. We're having a conversation, and yeah. he's having a conversation with me. I'm still not even grasping the fact that I am sitting in the car with an all time great. Top 50. Top 50, great. Maybe top 30. D- yes, easily. Yeah. And I'm like, we get to the to the arena, you know, he's he, he's a very modest guy. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He wasn't like, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. Because like, if Kevin McHale would have picked me up, he would have let me know who he was, right? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. <laughs> he'd, he'd have been like, you know, hey, brother, hey, I got, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, he, yeah. That's how he would have been. But yeah. each person is different. Yeah. So we get to the gym right for shoot around. He's taking me to shoot around. Put my stuff on. I'm in the starting lineup. <laughs> what? I didn't know the players. I only knew one player on that team, and that was Tyrone Nesby, because we're both from Southern Illinois, and he was in Sioux Falls with me uh, prior to, you know, getting a call wait, up. Wait, right? wait, So you get called up 10 days. They bring you straight to the shoot around from the airport. Straight to the shoot around. And you're in the starting lineup. In the starting lineup. For the game coming up that night. That night. Whoa. I haven't even checked in the hotel. I go straight from the airport That's to the arena. You're probably on cloud nine, right? I was on cloud because I didn't know I was <laughs> I thought I was coming in, you know, to yeah. back somebody up, you know, get, 10 days. Get acclimated. Get yeah. acclimated. First first game. 22-15-8. Whoa. Jeremy Lynn style. 22 15 and 8. Play another game. Similar number. Wait, 22, 15, and 8? And 8. 15 what? Sis. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You had two, the first game, you had 22 points, 15 assists, 8 rebounds. Yes, and that's my that's my closest ever to coming to a triple-double, even in my whole career. The first game off of a 10-day. I wasn't going back. <laughs> remember I told, hey, remember I told my homie, <laughs> hey, remember I told my homie, Pack my stuff. Oh man! I don't care. Even if they do cut me, I'm not coming back here. I'm not coming back to this. <laughs> right, right. You know. Wow. So, and okay. the rest is history. So after, after they saw about three games, mm-hmm. they said we're giving you a two year deal. So usually they'll sign you for the rest of the year. Right. First, and they was like, no, two years. Right, right off the rip, and pretty much the rest is history until I got cut by the Clippers. Okay, and so. You where'd you go next after the Clippers? Orlando. You were in Orlando with T Mac. T Mac Grand Hill. Oh, that was a good that was a good Orlando team. Pat Ewan. Bo Outlaw. Bo Outlaw. Uh Nick Anderson? No. Nope. Uh Horace Grant. Nick went on that team? No. Nope. He Nick, came after you? 
No, Nick had left. Nick was in the in the back end of his career okay. by that. Daryl Armstrong. D, uh, my homeboy, D.A., yeah, D, D. great D. mentor of okay. mine. Uh, who else was on this? Somebody else. On Mike that. Miller was a rookie. Mike Miller was a rookie. Okay. Uh, Pat Garrity. Shout out to Pat uh, Mike Miller. Pat, I like Mike. Mike, Mike Miller's a good dude. Yeah. Uh, uh, John Amici. John Amici. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Pat Garrity. Wow, that's ooh, crazy. That's Pat a time Garrity. capsule. Hey, me and he Pat. Play. What? Hey, all we ran was hot. When I got in the game, yeah. high pick and roll. Yeah, he could play. Him and, uh, and Matt Doliak. Matt Doliak. For Utah. Wow. Crazy. Yeah, yeah Matt Doliak. So you so you played with that T Mac team. So and, and you you already you started to really come into your own and and uh play well in that Orlando stint, right? Not the first year. But but how how long were you in Orlando? Two years. Two years. That second year you started. Second year. So so let yeah. me Go ahead. first year. Doc Rivers, once again, I got caught up into, remember I told you about my, my time in Missouri? Yeah. Right? So A system that ain't really. It, it, and Doc Rivers' system was go get it, but he had two go-getters. Come on. He had T-Mac and Grant Hill. Like, bro, you better wait for your shot. When your shot comes, then you just be ready, right? Get your hands ready, get your feet ready. Right. I've never been that. Right. I've been a creator. Like, I'm going to create a shot, right? So me and Doc butted heads. All year long, my first year, I, we got. To, I got to the point where I was shooting air balls from free throw pull ups, just in your head, in my head, turning the ball over, just come straight in the game and two turnovers in a row. I mean, just in my head because I wasn't used to. I didn't know how to play point guard, right? Like that, right? So the next year, I come back, and Grand Hill, um, we're on our way. We're in Memphis, and. I've been cut so many times, right, leading up to this. So I know what the how it feels. And I know the whole <laughs> scene when you about to get cut. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we in Memphis, right? And we all getting um and, and I was on a, a two year contract with Orlando. So if they had to cut me, they, they would have to pay me. Yeah. But I'm still in my mind like a cut can happen at any time, right? Yeah. So we're we're getting um I'm getting dressed and we're getting ready to play Memphis. This is the first year um the Grizzlies had moved to Memphis. And Doc says, one of the trainers come out and says, hey, Troy, Doc want to talk to you in the office. I'm like, shit, I'm about to get cut. So I, I made that slow walk that everybody who's been cut before know about that slow walk to the office, right? Right. <laughs> I, get, I get in the office, Doc like, sit down, shut the door behind you. I shut the door, I'm like, damn. At least I'm close to the crib, though. I was only like three and a half hours from home. Like, my grandma and them out there, I could probably could ride with them right back to the crib. So, I'm, you know, all that's going in my head. The regular like, stuff you're thinking. Yeah. Where, where am I going to go after this? Right here today. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So, um, he sat me down. He said, listen. He said, Troy, I know you're a killer. He said, I know you can get a bucket anytime you want. He said, and then this is his words. This is Doc Rivers' words. He said, you and Allen Iverson is no difference. He said, but he's getting the opportunity to do that. He said, and you're not. I'm like, where is it? I'm still thinking he about to cut me. I'm thinking he's just giving me that you'll be good in your next place, yeah, right? That, that final uh, farewell. Right, right. Yeah. So he's like, you you can get buckets. You're a great player. Like, you're aggressive. He said, I'm telling you all this because Grant Hill just been – um ruled out for the rest of the season. Oh, because he was hurt. His ankle. His ankle. He, he, had to get, he had to get another surgery mm -hmm. at that time. He was like, he said, and can't nobody else score. Not they you. need you. He said, so, he said, so from, he said, last year, I'm going to take the blame for that. He said, I'm going to take the blame for that. He said, but this year, you ain't got to say a word to me. I ain't going to say a word to you, do you. And from that moment on, I had like 25 that night. I was, I was stopping and popping from three. You know, stuff that he was telling me don't do the year before. Yeah. I was like, bro, you sure you want to tell me to he was like do you? Yeah. And from that moment on, when and that's what all it takes is the opportunity. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about that. Yeah. I and the, the main reason that we, we we're doing this podcast, and we gotta do part, we gotta do two part, because I know you gotta run at hour fifteen and we you we usually go a couple hours, but we'll yeah. do two parts so we can uh finish the conversation and, and as many times as you wanna come anyway, you right right here. But We'll talk about the opportunity thing in, in a moment. And the main reason we want to talk about this was about youth basketball. You yeah. started a youth basketball program. 
uh, uncheckable. And I, I coach uh, the seventh grade team. Your, your son's in sixth grade, mine's in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're very involved in the youth basketball aspect of, of the Minnesota basketball scene. Uh, so we, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But so Doc lets, lets you loose. Doc, yep. Doc says, go ahead, do what you got to do because they need you now. Right. Grant was hurt. Grant probably should have been one of the top 20 players of all time Ooh, if he hadn't got hurt. top 10. Maybe top 10. Yes. I was just watching some. Could be five. I, I was watching some. Yeah, I'm not he's your first. Lie. He's your first. He's your first you know who else modern day point forward. You, yeah, for sure. You know who else I was watching highlights of yesterday, too, where I was like, slide over here a little bit. Just touch. Yeah, right there. Um, Penny. Ooh. Oh. Boy, I was watching some highlights of Penny. Yeah. And you forget. I mean, you so when you watch basketball, there's so much basketball. There's so many, there's so many great players that come in each gen, not even each generation. Right. Each couple of years. Yes. Each every three years, there's new players. And you just so you 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 tend to forget about how, I mean the the, the great greats, yep. they're like burned in your memory. Right. But those second and third guys of that generation, you kind of forget about. Mm -hmm. And Penny, boy, I saw these highlights of Penny, and all I could think to myself is. If he wouldn't have got hurt. Oh, my goodness. He is scary. Yeah. Like, I look at him like, some people you look at from a different generation, you like, he was moving too slow. I, I, I think, I don't think he could have done that to me. Right. Penny was moving at a pace like, I don't know if no guards could guard him today. No. He was moving that well. Even Mike said it. He was scary. Mike said he was next. Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, he was scary. If Mike, if Mike say he, you the hardest person he's guarded. Woo. He was shifty and strong, and strong. And could jump. He had the, the wiry strength. He had big hands too. Yes. He was palming that ball, dunking Handle it. Handle it. Oh, he was cr creative. Shoot it. Oh man, he was yes. dangerous. Um. So so, but you're in Orlando. Doc lets lets you loose. Um. And you're playing with T Mac. That was did T Mac win an MVP? No. He was scoring title. <clears throat> so, I, don't, I don't think he was scoring. Did he win? I don't think he won the scoring title with us. Ooh, I think he was up there at the time. He was up there, yeah. Okay, no, but he didn't was, win a scoring title. Yeah, he didn't win a scoring Maybe title. Maybe Michael Red might have won one of those years. Was I that... think Mike was up there a couple of them years, yeah. but I think um, scoring titles went to AI around them years. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So you're in Orlando, and you go to – where do you go next? Minnesota. Here, Minnesota. Okay, and that's where and that's where the, the, the Laker killer yes. comes. So tell me about being in Minnesota. You had – when you came, was Terrell Brandon? Terrell Brandon was here, and that's and then and that's how it happened. Um, so in Orlando, um, on the eve of, because I was runner up, one of the run finalists for uh, most improved. I was one of the finalists for six man of the year. So I was the top free agent point guard when it, when you, when you consider like who's probably gonna be a a, a starter on a average team. Yeah. Or a backup on a great team that already have like an all star point guard, right? right? right. I was the next person in line for, for people to be looking for those type of players, right? At mm. the point guard position. On the eve of that, being able to start negotiating, someone got killed in my house in Orlando. Talk about that. Can you talk about it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's crazy because where I stayed, I stayed like five minutes from the practice facility. And I did that for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to get to practice quick, quick, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, I'm, I'm living in Orlando. I'm on a two year deal. I'm not, not about to from buy from here. Yeah, I'm not about to buy a big house. I'm on a two year deal, so I was renting a house close in Maitland, around the corner from Maitland, though, is the hood, the hood yeah. right? So, what happened was they had been like, so I had, I had a Benz, I had a um, Navigator, and I had a Prowler, right? And I had you know, like at that time, like everybody had, I had all my homies stand with me. Yeah, of course. Right. So, so, and we wasn't doing nothing, right? So we we would be outside, in front of the house, barbecuing. But you know, everybody seven out there, eight guys from the neighborhood hang out. You know, just they're supporting exactly making making not being at home feel like you're at home exactly. Mm -hmm. So we all did it. I did it too. So the house at that time had started getting cased. People riding through the neighborhood like locals. Locals riding through the neighborhood like, okay, we go get them. Must have thought we were dealers or whatever they thought, right? Because mm -hmm. no, no one. Because even if you saw me at that time, unless you was really into basketball, and even if you was really into basketball, and you just see me at a glimpse, 
you wouldn't know it's me, right? Right, because you're six two on. You're not seven foot. Right, and I got cornrows at the yeah. time. You know, yeah. and if you see Kevin me, Garnett in a crowd, you'll be like, oh, okay, this, this dude's seven lives. fucking and foot. And a basketball player lives here. Yeah, right. 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 So they didn't think they didn't know that it was my house. They were just casing. So on a Friday evening, I was out. Me and one of my homeboys, we out at the club. My auntie was at the house. Her daughter was at the house. Uh, my auntie boyfriend, who they were just visiting in town, someone knocked on the door. My my little cousin opened the door. Right, mm -hmm. that's it's normal. Like, okay, who is it? Open the door. They ran in with pistols. Uh oh. Right, mm -hmm. ran in with pistols, pistol whipping everybody, and they're asking, "Where are the keys? Where are the keys at? Where are the keys?" And my everybody's like, "He took his keys with him." Yeah, keys to his car. They're talking about keys of cocaine. Yes. It's Florida. Yes. Where are the keys? You've got to realize, for, for, and for you people that don't really understand, okay, Florida's an entirely different oh, yeah. world, especially in terms of- Charlemagne always tell you that. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's in terms of drugs, and especially when in terms of specifically cocaine. And people think Miami when they think cocaine, but you got to understand that entire, from Tampa, Orlando, up in Northeastern, it, it's all a-, a Port. It's yes. all a corridor. Exactly. Yeah. So the people that are around are the locals. They're very familiar with cocaine, and a big deal is Jack and cocaine. Yes. Yeah. And so they're asking for the keys, and the, and and so when I get back, because my uncle who pulled up after the whole situation was gone, he called. I'm at the club. He called like, "Hey, somebody just ran in the house," and boom, boom, boom. So I, I'm I, I get back to the crib, and the the all the cabinets are ramshacked through, right? And they talking about they was asking for your keys. And as I'm looking at like, why would they be looking in the cabinet for keys? So I'm like, no, they they think we sell dope. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They think we sell dope. So what I did was that night, I took everybody, we went to a hotel, right? We stay all night at the hotel Friday, Saturday night. It's right before the fourth of July. So I got my family coming. My grandma's about to drive up, my mom's coming in. And I told them, I said, come, you know, go ahead and come up. I'm in the hotel now, but we're gonna go back to the house on Monday, right? My uncle, you know, he a, he a street dude, right? Mm -hmm. And he was living with me, but he 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 naturally from the street. He said, I'm not leaving the house. If they come back, I, we all right, I ain't leaving. I'm there ain't nobody running me off. I was like, well, you can stay here then. I ain't. <laughs> <laughs> so he stays there on Sunday evening. One of our homeboys that used to come over to the house, he's from Orlando. He pulls up. My uncle's in the garage, a couple other guys in the garage. He pulls up, he get, he, he, you know, he's a great guy. Pulls up, get out the car, what's up, bro, what you know what I'm saying? As he do that, a white van pulls behind him, slide open the door, it was like mob style, and starts shooting. And he had his thing on him too, so he turned around and he's shooting too. And, Jeez. And, and luckily he did, not, I ain't gonna say luckily, but good he did that, because he ended up losing his life but he shot one of the guys, and the guy had to go to the hospital. Yeah, they had to pull off. They had to pull off. No, they didn't pull off. Okay. They ran through the house. Oh, they went to the house again. They went to the house again. Your house. Yes, but guess what? A second time? It was, it was two different, they didn't even know each other. Oh, two different people. Yeah. So far as you know. So far as I know, yeah. Okay. And so when that happened, uh, he ended up losing his life. Uh, they found cracking in the back of his trunk. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. And so all on, so the radio station, like all through the news and stuff. They're saying it's all connected to you. The dope. Of course. Right. Of course. But guess what happened? I was so embedded in that community, because even though I was there for two, two years, mm -hmm. I was always like in the hood, always, you know, just a normal person treating people the right way. The radio station got bombarded with so many calls saying, "My boy, he ain't, that ain't him." He, you know, what I'm saying. So it got bombarded so much that they had to retract on everything they were saying. Wow! Because the community really, you know, came through for me. So I was sitting at home in Illinois all summer long. Who wants to touch me? They don't know. It's unclear on what's happening. What's going on? Why? Yeah. Two yeah. nights in a row. He has to be into something. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't. I didn't know what the hell was going on, right? So long story short, 
three weeks before training camp started, I, I hadn't, no one was even talking to me. I'm talking about no interest because everyone wanted to make sure. Yeah, they're scared. Yeah. Timberwolves call. And they called my agent. My agent was like, hey, Troy, Timberwolves call. Terrell Brandon has to get surgery. So he's going to be out for, you know, beginning of the season. Mm. And no one else was available because everybody else had signed. This is all training camp about to start. So all the great. They're the already signed up. Already signed up. Mm-hmm. They bring me in. Um, had a hell of a workout. They were like, we want them. We want them. You know, they asked me about the situation, what happened. I said, I don't know. Yeah. I said, I ain't, it wasn't me. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, uh, Flip. Flip was like, I believe you. Yeah. He was like, okay, cool. So we get yeah. here. Um, Terrell Brandon is injured. Uh, Terrell Brandon is injured. And he's only supposed to be out the first month and a half, two months of the season, whatever, mm-hmm. his ankle. All of a sudden, Terrell says, I'm retiring. Mm. And the rest is history. They, I mean, they were stuck with start. They, they were stuck with me at the starting point guard position. Mm. And shout out to Flip. Flip always told me play your game. Yeah. Yeah. Flip was a good dude. Yeah, great dude. Yeah, I liked yeah. Flip a lot. He uh, rest in peace to Flip Saunders. Shout out to Ryan Saunders. He's a good guy too. Yes. He was one of my teammates at the University of Minnesota. He was a walk on, but he was a good guy. Hopefully, he uh, keeps continuing to coach and. And the uh, the the path of his his dad, his late dad. Um, Flip was a good guy, man. He I remember Flip was talking to my grandfather when the remember when I my senior year there was controversy around whether I should win Mister Basketball or not because um because I had transferred and right. you know stuff like that had gone on at, at De La Salle. And, uh, I remember my grandfather had a conversation with Flip about about Mister Basketball and Flip told him if anybody else wins Mister Basketball, it's a shame. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a nice flip. Um, so you play for the, you come to the Wolves, Minnesota. It's been probably a little bit of a, a shock from being in Orlando. It's a totally different world, kind of different, different than Carbondale too. Yeah, it's its own place. Right, right. Um, it's its own place, and you obviously had a a, a, a great time here uh, playing with Kevin Garnett, mm-hmm. who's a you know first ballot Hall of Famer, one of the all time greats of this position, one of the all time greats of in, in general. And on that team, you Sam Cassell. Well, Sam Cassell came right. Yeah. Sam Cassell. Um, well, that was my second year when Sam came. When Sam came. Yep. Um, Sam Mitchell? No. Mitchell was on. He's Mitchell, gone. He's gone. Um, Spreewell. Peeler. Peeler's gone. Peeler was here. Peeler was here? Yeah, Peeler was here my first year. Second year he went to Sacramento. Yes. Okay. Uh, Spree. Yep. Joe Smith? Jazz was here. Okay. Yeah. Okla, uh, Oliver Candy? Can- the Candy Man was here. Uh, who else you had? Uh, Oliver Miller. Oliver, big Oliver Miller. Big Craig o- Smith? Craig Smith was Craig came a year or two later. Okay, um, who else was on that team? Uh, Trent Hassel. Big oh Trent Hassel, who who was in, incredible. Yeah, you had to see you had to see Trent Hassel play in the summer away to from know, the Wolves to know he can score. To know he was a bona fide scorer. Yes, I remember the first time I met Trent Hassel, I was going to the gym with. Big E, yeah, uh, who's a big brother of mine, who's from Flint, Michigan, and and you know was involved in some of the open runs in the summer with the pro guys. And I come to the gym, and Trent Hassel there, and even as a little kid, I'm like starstruck. You know, he right. was Trent Hassel. Didn't matter if he was a role player to me. Right, right. He exactly. played in the NBA. Right. I'm 12 years old. Right. I'm like this is Trent Hassel. Right. And Chris Humphreys. Yeah. You know, Chris Humphreys is there playing, uh, and they're just going at it back and forth. And all I kept, all I, all I could keep thinking was, Trent Hassel is so. Hard to guard. Yes. And Chris Humphreys is trying. Yeah. Now, Trent Hassel couldn't really guard Chris Humphreys either. Because he's big. Because he's huge. Yeah. He's like a robot. But Trent Hassel was very hard, and he shot it very well yes. from the three, yeah. off the bounce. Yes. One of those players, I think, if he had a – if and not to knock flip or what y'all were doing, but mm-hmm. in today's game where it wasn't so focused around the isolation of a single player, yep. where everybody gets it, plays off the catch, and does a little of what 15, they can do. 15 to 20 a night. Trent could get 15 to 20 a night. Yeah. Um, and he was a great defender, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, he was prides himself on defense, but he could really score it. Um, talk to me a little bit about this, about about your Timberwolf stint, uh, and and just the, what it was like in that series with the Lakers. Um, well, my stint here, like I said, I give most of that credit to Flip Saunders, and all my 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 
two years prior to, well, my year prior to coming, I played for a point guard, which was Doc Rivers. And Flip is a point guard. So I love playing for point guard coaches because when you play for your position coach, of course you're going to get a little bit more leeway. And sometimes it's tougher on you too because they're a point guard, right? right. So, but Flip, I remember coming into camp. And and like I told you, well, you you got to, one one you got to live at one, huh? One o'clock you got to go. Oh, we good. What time? One is it? No. What time is it? Twelve fourteen. No, I, I got to. No, I'm we good. Okay, go ahead. Um, so when I first get to Minnesota, and remember going back to high school, going to, to Missouri, yeah, struggling in 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 Orlando. I always came back to. They wanted me to be a point guard, wanted me to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when I came here, Terrell uh, Brandon was the, the 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 one of the greatest point guards in that era. In the era, yeah, consummate point guard. Yes, you know. Knew he, how to run a team. Knew when to get his shot. Yeah. So I'm thinking I got to fill his shoes, mm -hmm. right? So I get to camp, and I'm in camp. I'm doing, you know, coming down. I'm making my... Make a pass and make a pass. Mm -hmm. I'm in. I'm in my. I'm in my basic bag, right? In my fundamental bag. Over exaggerate. Over exaggerate. Big ball fakes. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> at, at, after about the second practice, flip goes. What the fuck is this? He, yeah, yeah. He what the fuck put, are you doing? He pulled me aside. He said, "Who are you?" <laughs> I said, "Huh." It was like I, I was like, I he's like, "Who are you?" I said, "I'm sure." He's like, "No, you're not." Yeah. I'm, he's like, "He said, listen." That the way you play, that ain't how you play. He said, "I watched you play. That's the reason why I like you because I watched the way you play the game." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, he like, listen, be you. He said, "If you're doing too much, I'll let you know." He's a great coach. He said, "If you're doing too much," he said, "I need you to be." He said, "The only way for us to be successful is if you be who you are." Mm. And from that point on, he kind of created the Laker killer at that moment. Yeah, because now it's. KG set the pick instead of me looking for KG on a roll every time. If, if if the big is in drop cover, I'm shooting it. I'm shooting it from thirty, mm -hmm. which people wasn't doing then. Like when I when I was shooting those, like that's why it was so surprising in in that Lakers series. They weren't doing that. They were getting to fifteen feet. Yes, they were keep penetrating, get to fifteen. If he doesn't pick you up, then now I'll shoot that pull up jumper. Exactly. Yeah. So I was doing what they do now back then in two thousand and, and two. Yeah. Like I was coming off, so during the year I only shot probably two and a half threes per game during that whole year. In that series, I shot seven to eight threes a game. A big difference. A big, a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's what really, cause cause Shaq would be in in drop coverage all the time, and KG was such a unselfish player that he knew that he was like. I'm about to nail Derek Fisher ass with this pick, cause Huddy coming off. He's a great and, screener, KG. Yeah. Oh yes, cause he know like, he knows the game. If you make if you if you a great screener, you are usually gonna get the ball. Yeah. Especially if you got a, a a big that's gonna play up. Yep. Shaq didn't play up though, so I was just jacking. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So in that series, it was all about. And, and, and it's weird because Clayton Wilson, who is was our equipment manager. That first game, it was at home. Uh, we had home court advantage. That first game at home, we lost by like 25. Two days later, we come in, Clayton Wilson, funny guy, equipment manager, just always in everybody's business. That's what the equipment managers do. They know all the, the gossip, right? Right. So he comes up to me, he said, Troy, he said, you got to shoot the damn ball tonight. You have to really go off and we're going to have a chance. This the equipment manager. Yeah. And I took it to heart. And I had 37 that night from the equipment manager. And that's I tell my and that, and, and and this goes back to what I, I try to give to the youth. You can learn something from anybody. Yeah. If you open your ears and just, you know what I'm saying, and take advice or whatever. It was an equipment manager who gave you that confidence. To go on a roll in that series. Yes, sir. Wow, yeah, that's that's an, uh, an incredible. Uh, it's 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 funny, you know. It's and we we place a lot, and I want to transition to talk about the youth sports yeah. thing because um, you had a for all of those out there who 
didn't see that series. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you can go see the highlights easily on, on YouTube on today. YouTube, yeah. um, but I remember being a kid watching it and I was like, this is, this is crazy. Yeah. Cause I didn't really, you know, I knew who you were, but you didn't really have even that, that star power name yet. That was kind of that coming out party where it was like, damn, this dude is playing with the, this is the best. I mean, yes. Derek Fisher, and people underestimate how good Derek Fisher yeah. was at that time. I mean, he was very, very Especially good. Especially on point the defensive guard. end, too. Strong, strong as strong Knox. As hell. Yeah, very strong. I had to use my shiftiness. Kobe, Robert Ory, Shaq. That year they was they was coming off a of back to back. They were trying to go for a three P. Yeah, that was three P year. Yeah, so that was the Lakers. Yeah. And that you was, guys uh, took them to game six. What we was lost it? in game we lost in game six. Six, yeah. All right. Big, still big time series, yeah. big time series. Helped shape my game for sure. Yeah. Just watching series like that. That was back when you used to watch the full game. You're right. That yeah. was back when you 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 knew the game was coming on. You sat down. I know. You had around. the little food and you know you had the little hors d'oeuvres and everybody was ready for the game to start. Yeah. We watched the pregame. Right. It's all that. You watched the pregame. Yeah. You watched the game from start to finish. You yes. know, you did yeah. when you want to miss a moment, even right. at halftime. You watched the whole halftime show. Yes. You know that was that that era. Um, Moving to youth sports, and, and this is why I brought you today. And, yeah. And we've been dealing with this AU stuff and in, in the uh, the youth side of things. It's a crazy scene out there now. It's a crazy. First of all, the game is the game is crazy. The game is globalized. The game has become um, almost a religion. Yeah. And people don't understand. It, it fits into what I've been saying on the podcast because I talk about sports being a new religion. Yeah. And it's it's one thing if you look at it from like okay how many people are going to church versus how many people are tuned into basketball. Now coaching, I'm starting to see it from how much parents are involved in their kids' lives when it comes to sports and basketball yep. and maybe not so involved in other places, not saying anybody specifically. I mean, just in general. Mm-hmm. There's sort of an obsession about youth sports that is obviously delusional for the most part. Right. So therefore it's unhealthy, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, people, everybody thinks their kid has a chance to to go pro. And, and the scary part about that is – they won't even listen to people who actually know what it takes to go pro right. in that pursuit. Like yep. if my first of all, my goal is not for Lil Royce to go pro. If right. he can, great. Right. I want to be as good as he can. I want him to get as much as he can out of basketball. Learn how to set a goal and, and reach a goal. Be able mm-hmm. to do the things that he sets out to do. He's fortunate in a gene pool where he's probably going to be at the size where he has a good shot to to excel in basketball. Right. Pro or not. Um. I mean NBA or not. But that's not my goal. Right. But if it was my sole goal mm-hmm. for him to be, go to the NBA, right? I would if if I wasn't going pro myself, it would certainly be to find somebody who knows what it's like to go pro, has coached a pro player, has trained a pro player, was a pro player, something. Yes. And listen to them in terms of what he needs to do. Exactly. Not to say that they will know for sure. Right. But they probably got a better chance than your average whoever, yes. of of knowing what, what it takes. Talk mm-hmm. a little bit about just the, the uncheckable program that you started and, and the youth scene, why you're doing it, and just what how crazy it is out there in the youth sports. Um, well, you know, uncheckable was started, um, we're, we're in our fourth uh, summer, right? And you, and you was there the first year. Yeah. And we started with uh, eight or nine kids, and, and we didn't even have enough at one age level so we we put two age levels together, right. and then we had to play at the the oldest per- person's age. We had to play at that level. So right. we had some younger kids playing up, and um, as we created, you know, that type of a uh, culture, we start uh, of course naturally started getting people that wanted to you know be involved in Uncheckable to the point where our numbers started to grow, and we were able to to create different teams for their appropriate age groups. Mm-hmm. Um, but my my main reason for doing it, of course, is my son um, being able to make sure that he's getting the right guidance. And when I say the right guidance, a lot of people look at it and they say, just basketball. To me, b- basketball is a business. So for me, it's the business of basketball. Mm-hmm. And we haven't got this far, like I said, it's only the fourth year. So as we continue to build this brand, I'm trying to add different levels, different levels 
on top of each other each year. Like all, I tell my son this every night. Son, you're not guaranteed to make it to the NBA. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're not. Yeah. Don't uh, get that in your head. Marcus Jordan is not in the NBA. He's Michael Jordan's son. Right. Come on. Right. So he was my class. He graduated in 09 when me played in the Michael Jordan classic. Right. Uh-huh. So you're not guaranteed. I made it. He didn't. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And your dad didn't play in the NBA. No, he did not. Right. Yeah. So you're not guaranteed. I said, but one thing I'm going to teach you through the medium of basketball, if you love this sport and if you love sports, you can be a player, you can be a coach, you can be a GM. Hell, you can be a basketball trainer. They're making six figures. All these things I'm showing you. You can be a broadcaster. A broadcaster. You can be a referee. A referee. All kinds of stuff. All you can for the love of this game, which I know you have naturally, there's so many avenues. And and I think what we're what we're like me and you, what we are falling, what we're seeing is you're seeing a lot of parents that don't understand that. Mm-hmm. And their actions show that they don't understand there's more than one way to skin a cat mm-hmm. with this game of basketball because everything is focused around their kid making it to the NBA only as a player. Right. And not understanding that. I told my son this, so because I have I have real conversations with my son, and I told him I broke it down like this. I said, "Listen, son, Doc Rivers probably made six million dollars as a player, and he was only able to play twelve or thirteen years, whatever amount of years he played." Mm-hmm. I said, "He's in his twenty some twenty something years of coaching. Come on, he's probably made over a hundred million coaching, coaching." <laughs> and he's going to be able to continue to coach. For sure. Not even. He's going to coach until he's 70. Exactly. He's on track to. He's going to be making. How old is Doc now? 60? 60 something, yeah. Yeah, he's going to coach until he's 70 at least. If not longer. I mean, yeah. And I said, I said, so, and I told him, I said, even with me, had I known there was many other avenues outside of just being a player, I would have set myself up for that. And so that's, that with, with Uncheckable, that's, one of the main goals uh, in this youth organization is to get kids to understand there's more than one box to check. Hence the name uncheckable. And it, it's, it's, it's crazy that you say that because you know, I, I, I had to look, move a little bit this way. Yeah. Um, I had, a, you know, I got my own unique career stories. Everybody knows, especially people that watch the podcast, but I never knew how much I like teaching the game until my little brother was playing at Hopkins. Right. And I started going to his practices yep. um, and and being there with Novak and, and kind of. Well, hold on, hold on. Okay, yeah. Hold, hold, no, hold that. Okay. But you remember I I, I, I used to t- always tell you, bro, you got to start coaching. You're like, I ain't done playing yet. Well, and, I I'm like, I, and I'm like, bro, once you start coaching, well, I'm trust you're me, you're going to love it. Yeah. Well, you know, and you, you, you have these ideas – well, first off, when you come through as a player and you're as high level as I was, mm-hmm. I mean, coming through the process. Right. Like, your process was different mm-hmm. because you weren't a high school All-American. Right. You were good, but you weren't All-American. You weren't. So when you when you start, and it's almost a harm to you. Mm-hmm. And I worry about a lot of my fellow players that came through the process in the same way in the way that their mentality is. Like, I can go back now and see certain players and see how sort of demoralized they are when they can no longer play. Mm-hmm. And they have trouble just from a pride and ego standpoint of making that transition to right. say, because for a lot of them too, and I think this is part of the issue, for a lot of them, it's not the love of the game. Mm. You know, that's that's one thing that kind of goes unspoken. We kind of assume that everybody who plays this game loves the game. A lot of the people who play it, play it because they feel they need it to do something else. Right. And that's fine. I mean, that is part of it. Mm-hmm. And some of those people, like you said, leaving the projects, that was a motivator. Right. But when you really fall in love with the game, teaching the game, seeing the game, watching the game, understanding the motion, the patterns, the way the game, when you really fall in love with it, you can't be away from it. Right. Whether you play or not. And so, you know, coming through as a star player, I didn't really realize that. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't until I was able to get back to the high school and, and really – be with the young guys and teach them things I had I had learned where I was like, damn, I really love coach to the point where Novak is like, man, you make a really good coach. Like you should you should really think about 
getting your degree in and probably coaching in college or something because you're like really good at it. Right. And I was like, man, I'm done. I'm not done playing yet. And I'm still not done playing. Right. I mean, my thing, I'm 33. I just turned 33. I look at some of my counterparts out there. They're playing at the Jeff Green. Right. Jeff Green just got dunked on the other night by uh, uh, who was a young fella from uh, who were they playing? I forget who they were playing exactly. But one of the young, long uh, uh, leapers in the league, mm-hmm. younger cat. And he just took a – Jeff Green tried to take a charge. You know, right, good, yeah, yeah. good veteran move. Right. But Jeff still got bounced yeah, at do. 37. Yeah. For 30, I mean, he's a – physically, he's like a baby LeBron built. But he just – you know, that age catch up with you where yeah. four years ago he would have went up and tried to block that. Yeah. You know, now he tried to take a charge, ends up on a poster. Well, you can't take a charge on these kids. They go jump over you. Oh, man. Father time is undefeated. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, even Jeff Green's story with him having the, the heart condition and coming through that. I played with his brother uh, up in Canada, his younger brother. He was on, on my team in Canada. But anyway, I mean, it just, you know, I, I didn't even realize that coaching would be as fulfilling as it is. And, and even myself now at 33, I'm kind of looking at it like, okay, I could keep playing in the big three. Mm-hmm. That's fine. That's in the summer. That'll be there. Cat just retired at 48. Right. Catino Mobley, uh, who, who you know well. And um, I, I could do that. I never want to play overseas again. Mm-hmm. The most I would probably do is play in Mexico or Puerto Rico. Uh, but I don't really want to. I mean, I just kind of miss that five on five at times. So that's why I'm be starting to pro am because selfishly, I just want to play five on five right, a little right, bit right. while yeah, I yeah. still can. So, so I'm gonna pick up. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And until my back gives out or whatever the case may be, God, God forbid. But um, focusing on the coaching is definitely even more fulfilling than playing ever was, mm-hmm. because you get to you get to help young men grow up. Like we just came from the the made the Nike, or not Nike, but close made, to Nike, yeah, basically, yeah. yeah, mostly Nike teams, but the made hoop circuit, which is one of the premier circuits in, in the country. Uh, and and all the people you see that you know, I ran into Jason Maxiel, ran into uh, you know a couple other people out there, uh, you know, over the course of the weekend. But just what you you're able to um, spend the time with the kids that has nothing to do with basketball, right? I mean, you know, I, I really emphasize with my team things like um, keeping track of your stuff, keeping your stuff in order, walking as a team. You know, not being uh, not being caught up in your own world, not being in your own little world, right? Are you with your team? As a team, are you making sure that you're not leaving no other guys behind? Right. Right? Are you making sure that your whole team is together? You keeping track of your guys? Are you saying, hey, you going to the bathroom? I'm going to come with you. Or uh, I'm going I'm to come at least stand and, and watch so we can stay together. Right. Right? Little stuff like that. Or we're at the house, the Airbnb. Are you just throwing your stuff all over the place? Or are you keeping track of your stuff? When we get ready to roll out, do you know where your stuff is? Or are you the guy who's losing stuff? Teaching young men how to Discipline. be young men. Yeah, through basketball. Right. Is so much more even important than winning and losing in terms of developing them as as people. Yep. And 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 now I see where where you'd be mad at a coach for a certain thing when you were younger. He was giving you that hard lesson. Yes, yes. You had no clue what he was, why he was doing it. You just right. couldn't, because all you could think about is basketball. I'm trying to play. I'm trying to score. I yep. want to get to college. I want to. Yeah. But he's trying to teach you something that is that has nothing to do really with the game. It has more to do with life. Right. And uh, I think a lot of these parents just don't. They just don't get it. They, they don't, don't get that basketball is is a teacher of life. It's yes. not just about. Being in the NBA, I mean, that's you got a better chance of 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 being a. They said win the lottery. You got a better chance of winning the lottery than you do making an NBA. Yes, you know. So, so, so what? So what happens when you when you don't? What, what yeah. happens when you don't make it to the NBA? Well, I've seen what happens for a lot of kids. Yeah. What happened? This is this is the sad sad reality, and this is where basketball has become somewhat of a detriment on the black community specifically. It's mm-hmm. done a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Gave a lot of people money. Yep. But you only see the cream of the crop. Right. You don't see all the kids who at seventh grade, eighth grade, had these hoop dreams of becoming something. And they don't make that elite traveling team or they don't, they go to ninth grade. They don't make that ninth grade team or they don't make varsity or or they get kicked off a team because they have a bad attitude. They think they should be higher than they are or get more time or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And they go to the streets and, and, and they their parents never equipped them which, like you were telling TJ, right? Well rounded. You, you might not make it to the NBA. You, you shouldn't even. You, you're not. You shouldn't expect that this will be given to you, right? And they end up on drugs. They end up smoking weed. They end up hanging out in the neighborhood. 
they end up, and this is widespread. Yes. Because again, basketball is a cheap sport. So growing up, all the kids play basketball. And slowly but surely, the ones that fall off and can't continue to to go up mm -hmm. in it, they they get you can see that they get depressed right. about it. And I don't even think they noticed that that's what it was in their childhood. But I noticed it from my friends that came up the same way. And now I was fortunate. I played on a young AAU team of where our boys are now. And like eight or seven of the kids on my AAU, my single AAU mm -hmm. team for one grade, ended up touching pro basketball right. at some level, Europe or college. But you know what, though? Go ahead. Shout out to Howard Pulley, too. Yeah. Because he was a father figure. For sure, you know what I'm saying, Uncle like, Uncle Renee. Yeah. yeah, so so you 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 got you got a um. I think there is a lot, especially in this AU world, there is a lot of organizations that are about their brand, mm -hmm. and they're not about the kids. You know, whenever you get in organizations and they're cheating to win. Playing guys who are older, reclassing them, yes. or bringing them down, and 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 you get and you and, and you can kind of even if you even if you listen from the sideline, and if, if you listen to them coach, everything is about how do I get this win and not the little victories, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like I remember our first year going out on the road from Minnesota. Um, and we went out on the road where you were allowed to press in Minnesota. You can't press into sixth grade. Right. So this was fourth grade year. We went out on the road and we're playing against teams that's been pressing since they uh, came out the womb. Like you know what I'm saying? They came out the womb and they was pressing. Kindergarten. <laughs> Kindergarten. Right. Diamond. Diamond. <laughs> Take the ball from. Them. I don't even care about this kid. Right. Yeah. Um, and we were getting demolished. Mm -hmm. And and we we're getting demolished because we wasn't used to that pressure and that speed. Second year, we were focusing on beating the press. We came back, and then in the first year, we got the ball up one out of ten times. Yeah. Second year, now we're getting the ball up five out of ten times. You still had people that was disappointed. I wasn't because it was the small victories, right? Even though we don't win the game. But say, I mean, go say, say you know what it is. Yeah. These people's identity is wrapped up in the success of their AU team. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, and that's just sad. Yeah. I mean, you know, and that that's that comes from their hoop dreams of their, being deferred. Of, of their yeah. AU team. <laughs> Not the individuals within on the team. It's just their brand. But it's just funny because again, it's it's you know, it's that sequence of unfortunate events where you didn't make it where you wanted to make it yeah. to. And now you you putting way too much emotion. And don't get me wrong, like I'm an emotional coach too. Oh, yeah. when, I'm, when I'm on the sideline, I'm yelling, but I'm not yelling because it's really about the winning. The winning. It's about are you trying hard enough? And are the you, are and you the going discipline. after? And the discipline. The discipline. Or are you retaining what I'm teaching if you? If we say, if your if your college coach says, listen, no middle. We know sometimes you're gonna give up the middle. Yeah. But if you give it up three times in a row, you, you're giving up like you, yeah. You basically are either saying, I don't care what you're saying. Right. Or you're saying I don't care about what I'm involved in. Right. Or I'm saying, or I'm just not paying attention. Exactly. And all three of those are unacceptable. Unacceptable. In life. It has nothing to do with this game. Now, if I know you're not physically able, different. <laughs> different. If you can't do it, you can't do it. Right. That's the whole different deal. But I know you can. But these coaches, you can just see their identity. And it, you know, this is where the basketball becoming more commercial has its pros and its cons. Yep. There's going to be more money, more opportunities, and that's good. And you're going to have more guys who, who let's say, more people who find a a, a home yes. in the basketball world right. because it's got more commercial. Yes, but at the same time, it sort of waters the whole thing down from a from an integrity standpoint mm -hmm. because you start to think about it for all the wrong reasons, like anything else in life, yeah. you know. And so, you know, it's it's. I think the reason why I'm so interested in being involved in the at the youth level is obviously my son plays and, and my little you know little TJ, my mm -hmm. nephew plays and. And some of these other guys who I think like sons, you yes. know, it's them. But it's also like the people who have these AU teams are are safe, are vanguards of the integrity of the game. Yep. Right. Because if if us at the youth level don't hold up that integrity of what what little is left in basketball to be pure and about the person, nobody's gonna think about it because the machine don't care. Well, American basketball. Right. Right. American basketball. That's why you're seeing. 
the fall of American basketball is because they're not holding up the integrity of the game. Yes. In Europe, they are. Absolutely. And that's, that's the difference. That is the, in Europe, it's all about discipline, doing things the right way, playing the right way, understanding the game. Everything is discipline over there. Here, Only in basketball, too. Yeah. It's weird because in Europe, the rest of Europe is, the European sports culture yeah. is different than the rest of European culture altogether right. in many ways. Yeah. Like the way they go about sports mm -hmm. has its own kind of world to it. I don't know if you've ever seen European pro basketball, but it's very rigid. It's very fundamental. It's very systematic. It's right. very uh, uh, discipline based. Yep. You know, where the rest of Europe is kind of, you know, getting a little little out there in, in, in other ways culturally. But right. America American basketball has completely lost their minds. Yes. We lost it. Because every everything is it's more of a business too early. Right. It's a business too early. Like you got you got a lot of these parents and a lot of these program directors, they're they're treating this as a business too early. To me, it becomes a business at the 15 to 16 you. High school. High school. Because right. if you ain't got it by high school, you probably not gonna get it. Right. Right, so if I'm still screaming at you to get midline and you 16 you, you gonna have trouble in college. Well, and even more importantly, like you were saying earlier, in terms of other things you could do when it comes to basketball. Exactly, yeah. If you can't remember to get midline, you probably are gonna have trouble being a coach, a manager, a trainer, a broadcaster, a man, uh, a ref, a man. Yeah, you're gonna have <laughs> trouble in life. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. For, you know what I'm saying? For sure. And that's what this basketball is about. Is about the discipline. To, I told the kids the other day, um, my kids, when I was sitting them down before practice, I said, "How many?" I said, "All of you guys want to go pro, which is fine. I want you to have dreams." Mm -hmm. I said, "The first thing of going pro, just like with everything. And you don't always have to have this, but if you do have an opportunity to have it, you take advantage of it. I asked him, I said, how many players have ever touched an NBA court? 5,000. 4,800, right? Yep. 5,000. I told them, I said, I, said, I want y'all to understand Y'all got two of them in this gym right now. <laughs> right, two out of 5,000 of the 5,000, yeah. And I said, the bas basketball has been around for 70, what, eight years? Yeah. 78 years, 77, whatever. 77 years NBA has been around. You have two. I said, so 5,077 years is not a lot. I said, understand this. How many players at your age has the opportunity not to only be coached by NBA players, but even meet one. Just to meet one. Yeah. I never met an NBA player growing up. I was I was lucky. First NBA player I met was when I got to the NBA. <laughs> Picking you up from the from but, the from the airport with the see, sign. You're yeah. from a big city, so you, you yeah, gonna run Minnesota. Across. Yeah, you're gonna run into them. Yeah. Because it's Minneapolis, yeah. Yeah, but I'm from a you know what I'm saying so I'm like I said, so listen, I'm not telling you, I would never tell you not to listen to what your parents are saying on the sideline, but if you want to be successful <laughs> in this game, yeah, I said, take advantage of the fact everything, every word that comes out of my mouth, every, every word that comes out of Roy's mouth, you should be understanding that it has some validity to it. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, you know, again, and I'll say this, there are some players out there, you know, we know guys that play that that their, their personality doesn't translate necessarily into teaching consistently. Right. Right. Just because you play doesn't mean you'll be a good coach. Right. Now, you st probably still have some things to offer in terms exactly. of the game just from experience. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you can teach. Right. And there are certain pl people who play certain styles uh, who have a better – chance to cheat teaching the game well than than others. You know, right. people who played the game from a more cerebral standpoint. Mm -hmm. A lot of the guards make good coaches because guards have to be responsible for more during the game. Right. Usually. Yeah. Right. And that's why you see 
in the league yep. who ends up being the coaches. Right. Guard. A lot of point guards. Yep. Derek Fisher, you know, it, Doc you know, Rivers. Doc yeah. Rivers. Avery Bradley was a coach. You know, Rondo Steve will be Kerr. Right. Rondo's going to make a great coach one day. Yeah. You know, so you you see, you know, that, that just has to do with the flow of the game. Not to say big men can't coach, mm -hmm. but, you know, it is what it is. Um, so, but, but what, what, what blows my mind is if you're a parent and you want your kid to get to the NBA, even though it's far fetched, if I want my kid to get to the NBA, how, uh, how narcissistic and, and sort of detached from reality do I have to be to think that what I'm going to say to them is going to be better for their development than what somebody who's actually been there is going to say. I mean, yeah. it's almost like, a, you know, that becomes the greatest symbol of how sick our culture is. Not yeah. only do we want to make sports religious, right. but then you want to be the preacher and you ain't never even read through the Bible. Right. Right? Yeah. You want to be the preacher in, in the new religion of America, but you've never even opened up the Bible. And I'm not saying some of them didn't play. Right. You could play in high school. You could play... But you want your kid to go to the NBA. The highest level. If you want your kid just playing high school, there's going to be a lot of kids who play in high school. Exactly. Not as many as you would think. And you probably can, you can give them that knowledge because you play in not high school. Not as many as you think, though, because I know a lot of kids who get to high school thinking it's going to be a cakewalk and they end up not playing as much as they would like to. Right. But your kid could probably play high school. Probably, maybe, depending on where they go to school. You come to Hopkins, it's, it's a competitive, yeah. tough, tough chopping block. And everybody want to come. And there's 10 kids, 20 kids at every grade. Yes. Oh, so it's it's a gauntlet. It's deep. You might have to wait some, you know, yeah. you might have to wait. But Siani, Siani Chambers, uh, right. he, ninth grade, when I was in 12th grade, you playing behind five high major D1 players. Right. In the ninth grade. Right. Not to say that you're not talented enough to play on a team, just on this team, you got five Division One seniors. You got to wait your turn. You got to wait. And when he did, he ended up being Mr. Basketball. Right. Now, imagine if his parents would have said, shout out to, to, to Siani and, and Kamali's parents, yep. good people. Imagine if his parents had said, you know what? Kamali and Siani are too good to wait in ninth and eighth grade. They need to play right now. Right. That's the type of kid. Increasingly, yeah. these are the type of people that we're dealing with in this youth basketball that we're seeing yes. in this youth basketball stuff. And it's just killing these kids. And, 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 and the sad part about it is this. The, those people that are making those decisions don't know what they're doing. Right. That's the sad part about it. They don't know what they're doing. Most of these people probably didn't even play on the on on their varsity team, and if they did, they wasn't a high level player. Right. But everybody has an excuse. This is why I wasn't high level. The coach. He favored another guy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and they're and they're passing their down on their kids. Yeah. And what's going to eventually happen? I'm seeing it, and we talk about it all the time. A great talented kid who could have been something is going to end up not having an opportunity. Right. And it's going to happen at too too often. And not just in this city. Across the I'm across the country. Across the country. I'm look watching at, Look at the kid. Yeah. Look at look at uh Mikey. Exactly. Great and so and this is what I tell parents and this is this is what this is where it really gets this is where it almost gets so scary. Mm -hmm. You probably should only be involved in basketball for fun and not even you're better off not even thinking about actually having your kid go somewhere right. and just be involved in it for fun yep. and and participate from that spot because if you really knew just how small the eye of that needle is mm -hmm. it would scare you so bad you wouldn't invest no money in it right you wouldn't invest in it cuz it wouldn't be smart right you only invest in it because it's a part it's partly a passion of yours yes right because there's no it's it's ludicrous yeah like some of these kids out here, these high school kids, some of these high school kids out here, and they're, um, you know, they're only average at best at their grade. Right. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're not superstars like no, Mikey. Yeah. Mikey was a superstar, and and he made a few wrong decisions. Yep. I won't. I don't even know the specifics of it, but I could. I know the type. Right. Out here thinking he's grown. Listening to rap music, thinking it's cute, doing a bunch of dumb shit. You the man. Yeah, thinking he's untouchable. Some, got some dummies around Because at 17, yeah. if you're not parented well, yeah. even the kids who are parented well, at 17. I probably would have did something like that. People think they're untouchable. Yeah. 
well, you're not untouchable, and yeah. now you might be going to prison, right? And and that's unfortunate. Uh, or you're limb bias, and and you try drugs in the coke one era night. one night, and you die of a heart attack off of one one, one line. Time. Yeah, you know. So in those, but Mikey's the best player at his age. Mm -hmm. Lynn Bias was the best player at his age. Your kid is in the middle of the pack, and you think that he could actually afford to have an attitude problem? Right. He can afford to think he's the guy? He can afford to think the team should be revolve around him? Especially at the sixth grade, at the youth level. Bro, it's, it's, it actually keeps me up at night how basketball, youth sports is one of the greatest examples of how sick our entire yeah. country is. You 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 sit in the stands sometimes watching games. Like we'll sit in the stands and we'll watch just random games. Yeah. And we'll hear some of these parents. <laughs> and, and we'll look at each other like, it, it, are they serious? <laughs> they don't even allow the coaches to coach. Right. And you be like, where is your like me and you, we can sit in on the sideline, right? And we can watch our kids play, even if they're being coached by somebody else. And we can say certain things to them because we we know we're not gonna send them off the beaten track of what the coach is saying. Can't because the game's in a pattern. It is, it is, it's game one in pattern. pattern. Exactly. Yeah. So we know that. But I've seen some parents get the ball, go, push it, do this, do this, do this. I'm like, shoot it. I'm like, maybe their coach is not telling them to do that. Yeah. That's not within the with the game going on. Right. And so what you're what you're seeing is, and and I just feel so bad for the kids, because you see some great kids like you like he got game if he just work on this he do this he do this, mm -hmm. but their parents have their own vision of what they want their kid to be, that they're ruining it for them, killing them a kid, killing it. See it all the way up to the high school level, yeah, varsity level, yes, same thing, killing it. Like even in our program, Royce, you know our program, we got the. the the number one program, youth program in the state. Yeah. By far. Right there. Up D one probably right there, but I'm talking about I'm talking about like from from D one is great at your grade. Like seventh grade. Right. But you're talking about going younger. I'm talking about even down. Like 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 we just if, if they had six teams and we had six teams, you guys gonna have a battle with them, but our other five teams go blow out their other five teams. Right. So I'm talking about just across the board. Across the board. Yeah. Like we're number one, right? right. And y'all, y'all about to be there. Y'all about to start demolishing them too, right? Yeah, so, we're gonna be right there in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so we're right there, bro. I got, and I'm trying to create this culture for Minnesota, right? And so we have one top sixth grade team, right? Which we call our top team. Mm -hmm. One top seventh grade team. We have the ability to have three teams under the sixth grade that can compete against each other on any given night. But the moment that you say, okay, you didn't make the quote unquote top team. Now you're on the second team, which is good as the top team. We may have just got y'all by a little bit cause we got X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. but it's not that far off. You're going to be the number two sixth grade team in the whole state or the whole region. No one's going to be able to touch you. Mm -hmm. They say, no, we're going to go to a whole nother program because we're not on the top team. Not realizing that you're in a program with pros, and you're going to be learning from pros within this you would program. Rather go, you would rather go learn from somebody who, who only vaguely knows the game. Who you would rather go learn from somebody who you have no real clue about, a coach who you have no, you don't know. You don't know what they know and what they don't know. You're just rolling the dice. Just to say you're on the first team. Just to say you're on their top team. I mean that's it. I mean it. it, it, it <laughs> <laughs> you got to laugh at it. To us, it's. I mean. There's no again. I say it because sports. I'm I'm kind of glad that sports has become what it's become, because sports is the type of industry, even down at the youth level, that that makes everything wrong with it so obvious, right? Like there's a lot of things I talk about and deal with in politics where the 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 problems in it are detailed and nuanced, and you got to have a sort of complex understanding of the history and the way things progressed and right. and the way certain certain institutions affect these other institutions. Mm -hmm. There's more cause and, and, and correlation and things you gotta deal with. Not in basketball. Right. Basketball shows you face on, on face value. Yeah. These parents are having significant problems. Yes. Prioritizing. Yes. For their children. Yes. Let alone themselves. Yes. They're having a big time, pri their, their priorities are off. Yes. And they're disconnected from what they say. Like, oh, I want my kid to get to college or to play in college. Or I want my kid to play varsity 
varsity basketball even. Right. But you're not willing to have your kid learn from somebody because you're worried about what it looks like, what team they're on. Right. That doesn't even that that you're going against what you say your goals are for your kid. Right. Which scares really makes me feel bad for the kids. That's that's yeah. I'm like, man, I can't imagine right. what you're going through at home. Ex- I can't imagine. Right. You're Royce White, right? Mm-hmm. I'm Troy Hudson. Right? You could have easily said, you know what? I'm about to do my own program. Right. But you understand that that's why I didn't name it. That's why I didn't name my program Troy Hudson Elite. Right. Right. You know, I, I named it Uncheckable, and Uncheckable has, it has a, a meaning to it. Right. But you said, you know what? It's already going. That's boom. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to grab a team underneath, right? Right. You, we're living in a, in a day and age now where parents would rather say, I'm going to start my own program. So my kid can be the star. Rather than understanding that, what is this program about and uncheckable? Who's teaching? What level did they play? What have they done in life, period? Mm -hmm. Because I want my kid to be able to absorb all the knowledge that it takes to play at certain levels or be at a certain level in life. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Rondo, um, Raising Rondo, Rajan Rondo, who was up here uh, two weeks ago, right? Probably first ballot Hall of Famer. Definitely a first, but he better be a first. He better be. I was talking to him, and I was like, I was asking him. He was like, I was like, bro, how many teams you got? He said, this is my only team. He said, I had like seven or eight teams. He said, Troy, I had to, I just dissolved them because parents wasn't understanding what I was trying. He said, I had parents. He said, it wasn't even my own son's team. He said, I would go sit on the bench of one of the older teams or a younger team, and I'll take a kid out because they're not doing X, Y, and Z. And they said I was playing favoritism. And he was like, how was I playing favorites? My son ain't even on this team. <laughs> now I got favorites, other favorites. <laughs> right, and I said, I said, bro, I said, I said, and it's you. He said, I'm not even thinking the fact that it's me, but it is. I'm like, who wouldn't listen to Re- Rajon Rondo? Who wouldn't want their kid to play on a Rajon Rondo. I told my wife yesterday, I said, listen, if Kevin Garnett would have had KG Elite here, TJ would be playing for KG Elite. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're going to play for Lil, the biggest, gonna play for the biggest uh, night. Uh, it, 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 Lil Royce so, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't need it to be me. Come on. Kevin Garnett's the first ball, battle hall of favor. If he's going to be in the building, give him, give him my son knowledge, wisdom, whatever he's going to give him. Apparently, he has more of it than me. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not, but apparently he does. Well, I mean, and that's, that, that's tricky. And, and so it's I, tricky, yeah. But... I, I see where some parents can get caught up in a, in a sort of, a, what do they call it? It's like a trick bag. It's kind of a catch-22 because, at, 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 you know, at, at some levels, the biggest name has something to offer. You got to look at who it is. Yeah, who it is. Yeah, okay, yeah, let's yeah, look yeah, at who yeah, it is. Right, exactly. If it's KG, it's KG. It's KG. You're talking about a guy who quarterbacked the whole defense from the help side, right. from the back line. Definitely. Okay, and he brought the emotional intensity. Every who, game. Not only was it emotional intensity, but it was intelligent emotional intensity. It wasn't. I don't see KG. Draymond has he has emotional intelligence, but sometimes he uh, step a step lower than a couple steps lower than KG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But same, similar. Yeah, his errors is different. Yeah, and you can't help what area you grow up in. KG from a different era. Yeah. But but I I seen KG come in the gym mm-hmm. and pick up in yeah. the summer. Right. And and to and use the emotional intensity to lift the entire gym. Yes. And pick up. Yes. I learned from that. Yeah. When people watch me and they like, man, Royce is intense. Royce. I learned from him. Right. And then just from being around a few times, right? Just from watching them from the Wolves, because yes. we get all the local games. Mm-hmm. Just from watching them, I picked that up. Yeah. So there's certain guys who is Rajon Rondo's another one, right? Rajon Rondo is probably one of the smartest basketball players of all time. Well, Doc Rivers said he's the smartest player he's ever been around. Unbel- his IQ is not even comparable. Right. I mean, it's just on a whole different planet. Yeah. So imagine you don't want to listen to those guys. I know more than him. You are a fucking <laughs> retard. I know more. No, no, no disrespect. I but know. you're close. You're probably you're close to retarded. You gotta be. Yeah. 
You may not be clinically, you may not be on paper, right? But the way you're acting is retarded. If if, if Rajon Rondo was, it, let's say TJ go plays a a game with with Rondo Elite, yeah, I'm gonna sit in the stands. I ain't gonna say shit. I want him to get everything Rondo's gonna give him. Pause. Yeah, I want him to get get all the knowledge Rondo can possibly give you in this weekend. I want you to get that. I won't say shit. I would sit even if you if, even if I feel like you're not getting the shots you're supposed to get. You ain't getting the playing time you put. I'm gonna say something while, while you're here, you listen to every damn thing he's saying. Yeah. That, Everything. That's it. I mean, you know, and it's again, but that's that's where people who have been there, who have been there and done it, um, especially in basketball, right? Because I'll give you an example, right? Politics is completely different. Right. In politics, we say, we're at the point now where we don't want people who have been in it. Right. Because people who have been in it have to have too much of the bad that was in it. Yes. To trust them. Right. Because we see the results. Exactly. So you got to realize, separate, That's a, you got to distinguish, that's a results, results-based results assessment right. of the politics before. Exactly. Y'all had the po- political power. Yeah. The results don't show that you doing what's in our best interest. Mm-hmm. When it comes to the results of these people right. in the game of basketball, the results show 100% to the positive. Right. Right? Yeah. KG's results solidify him. They validate him. Right. John Rondo's results validate him. Doc Rivers as a player, then as a coach, it validates him. Correct. Now, you might have some disagreements. You might say, well, then why doesn't Doc Rivers win every year? Right. Or why didn't KG win three championships? Right. Why didn't, or why didn't Greg Popovich win anymore? I had people now saying, oh, Greg Popovich is, is washed as a coach. Greg Popovich is, done forgot more about basketball than mm-hmm. half the p- coaches in the league ever could dream of. Exactly. I mean, he's just, he's an encyclopedia of basketball. Right. Don't agree with his politics at all. Right. I don't. But mm-hmm. if 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 Lil Royce had the chance to go and be coached at a clinic by Greg Popovich. You're going. It's not even a question. I mean, it's just a no-brainer. You're going. You didn't see too much success. Too much success. Not to have it on you. And actual success too, not not man, not you know, not not a fabricated success. Right. Like I'm gonna make, I'm going to describe how this is success. Yes, that's how politicians do. They're like they try and convince you that what they did was successful. Mm-hmm. You right. see all these senators and congressmen. They always say what bills they were a part of. And look, the economy is still 35 trillion in debt. Right. Okay. San Antonio went out at the beginning of a season, 82 games to yep. win a championship to to raise up that trophy. Yep. And they did it. Yes. M- more times than most teams. In their era. And think about the time they did it with. If you go to a park, I don't care what nobody say. Yeah. If you go to a park, you was not going to pick up Tim Duncan. You was not going to pick up uh, Anthony, uh, uh, Tony Parker. Yeah. You might have picked up Ginobili because he was nice like that. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? You just, you know what I'm saying? But I'm talking about from face value. Yeah. The, Bruce Bowen, you was not going to pick him up. Mario Ellie. Mario, uh, you're not going to pick him Avery up. Avery Johnson. You're not picking him up. David Robinson, you're picking up. You're picking him because he was just a freak. Yeah, he was different. But 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 when you look at across the other side and you see some of that other talent that that talent beat, it was pop. Yes. Culture. It pop. Yes. It was culture, yes. system, yes. understanding. Yes. He made them better than what they could have been on any other team. I always tell people this. If you would have, if you would have put Kevin Garnett on the Spurs and put Tim Duncan with the Wolves, the results would have been different. KG would have had those three championships. She probably would have won more. Probably would have won more. My, my argue, I would argue that if KG had been on the Spurs, they would have won more than they than the Spurs won with with Duncan. Yes, because KG was. Not to say Tim Duncan wasn't good for the system and he wasn't great in his own right. Right, but. There was just things KG could do that Tim nasty. Duncan couldn't do. He was, he was nasty. I, I, people argue that all the time, and they always use the championships to justify Tim Ch- Duncan. Championships are where you at. Uh, come on, at that orga- level, organization, at that height, yeah, organization. It's a lot goes into winning. Yes. It's only one team that wins. Yes. But you as a fan, a barbershop fan, should not be comparing your knowledge to an NBA player's knowledge. That ain't the same as comparing Tim Duncan and KG. And I think part of this like culture of, Who's so who you pick? So who you picking at, at 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 the park? Who between who? <laughs> Tim Duncan and KG. 
Stop playing with me. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. I'm picking KG for a number of reasons. Yes. Too many reasons to count. Number one, you grew up in the Midwest. Right. Okay. Number two, you played in Minnesota. Right. I know you personally. So yeah. I'm playing favorites in that. Level. But just from a basketball standpoint, Skill he, wise. he could do things that Tim Duncan couldn't do. Right. Tim Duncan couldn't bring the ball. No. Up. And if KG had played in an era where big men were more bringing the ball up. And shooting threes. He probably could have been doing it. He could have done that too. Yeah. So, you know. Well, he brought the he brought the ball up. He played the one for y'all. In the conference finals when me and right. Sam was hurt. And you, this is how small the world is. The reason why I started playing the one at Iowa State. Yeah. This is how crazy. Because of Okay. This Fred how, played. No, let me show series. you how crazy the b- b- world, b- world of basketball is. LeBron was a point forward. But in LeBron's era, you know, there were only so many point forwards throughout the years. Very few. Who was the first? Uh, Oscar Robinson. Nope. Who? Who you got? Oscar Robinson was a point guard. He was 6'9", 6'8". He's a point guard, though. He was, yeah. But okay, who, Pippen? Nope. Lam- who? I'll give, hey, I'll, hey, I'll give who, you some. Who, who, who Paul Pressy. Oh, Paul Pressy. Okay. He's the first point forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, you got you got Pippen. Yeah. Lamar Odom. Yep. Um, Grant Hill. Yeah. Although short, somewhat short lived. Um, you got a couple other guys in there, but LeBron really, LeBron really solidified. He was the first. He was the first point guard that was the best player in the league at the time. I would argue. He was the. Oh, Magic Johnson. I'm sorry. But he was just a point guard. He was a point guard. Yeah. So anyway, I've, long story short, I mean, you could get into that yeah. deep. But still few and far between, right? To the point where, and here's how I measure it. When I came through, people were still shocked at the ability to be a point guard at that size. Right. They were still shocked when they said point forward. It was still a sort of a, a, a unique thing mm-hmm. to be, right? Which means just by default, there's obviously there ain't that many of them. Right. Because it's still a, it's still like a, a, a it's still like an anomaly, mm-hmm. right? Okay, so this is how small the basketball world is. I leave Minnesota. Fred happens to be getting his first coaching gig, okay, from retiring from or, or leaving the, the, the GM position, the front office position at the Wolves. Yep. He getting his first gig. At Iowa State, his alma mater. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to go to Kentucky. Calipari is like, look, your kids, mom, ain't no girls loud in, on campus with the players. We don't play like that. Too much exposure, too much liability. Right. We don't do that. I was like, well, I'm not missing Lil Royce being born. Right. I'm not about to be flying back and forth when she's going to labor. I'm not doing that. I'm gonna be there when my son is born. Right. Fred was like, three hours down the road, she could, if she wants to stay in Ames, she could stay in Ames. Right. Ain't no problem with me. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the mayor. I'm the mayor here in Ames. <laughs> it don't matter. You, that's no problem to me as right. long as you, you know, do the things you're supposed to do. And, and I always did. I was class. I was at the weight room early. I was, I was doing the things. was able to see my son be born. Fred, the way I got hooked up with Fred was through Wadjet and Wars, yeah. who I knew through you, yeah. right? Yeah. And Wars and Wadjet were cool with you. And when Fred went, they knew one of Fred's assistant coaches, Matt Abdel Massey. And I came off the couch. I wasn't even going to play. I was done. I was like, I'm not. I might not even play basketball anymore after the U of M situation. And then I was like, okay, let me see if you know Calipari. I knew John, uh, you know Wall and Demarcus Cousins. I would have actually played on that team with John Wall and, and Demarcus. Um, but I'm like, okay, you know, let me, uh, you know, let let me let me try and find a spot. And it ended up being with Fred. Now it just so happens that Fred played on the team where KG had to play the point guard. Because I think it was Sam Cassell got hurt, right? Sam, yep, Sam got hurt. I was already hurt. I had uh, You already, was already hurt, yep. yep. So KG had to play the one yep. during that series. I remembered watching it. Yep. And uh, and because of that, because Fred had experienced that, Fred let me play the one. Mm-hmm. And it really, it, it kind of transformed the game. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but let me tell you how. At the time when Fred was the coach and, and I was at Iowa State, Steve Kerr was still a analyst. He was not a coach yet. Right. He had not even joined the Spurs coaching staff as an assistant because remember he was assistant or pop first, right? Yep. And then he got the job at Golden State after Mark Jackson left. Draymond Green then ends up under Steve Kerr, mm-hmm. and Steve Kerr ends up utilizing Draymond Green as a point forward, the same way that Fred utilized me. Right. And I think they talked about it. I yeah. think Fred and Steve Kerr actually had a conversation about mm-hmm. that a little bit. But it's just funny how small the basketball world is in right. terms of. But the, and again, that just goes to show you, like, 
it doesn't matter necessarily if you know the right people or if you come from the certain cloth, but it can help. And it does make a difference sometimes. Yes, it does. And, and and certain things can put... So, like, when I tell my parents, I'm like, look, you're not talking to a guy who just played. Right. You're talking to a guy who played a unique position mm-hmm. at, that, tra- that now is coveted and understands the game at every position. Right. Positionless basketball, when you talk about where the game is going, I see these kids, all, they want to stick their kid in the post. They want their kid to be a shooter. They want their kid... And Novak, Coach Novak from Hopkins, you know, shout out to him is, you know, he he says it the best. All you guys got to be point guards. All of you. When the ball is in your hand, you're the point guard. When the ball is in your hand, you have to be the point guard. You, you're the point guard. It's so hard for people to understand that concept. Yes. And uh, I, I just, I'm glad that we're doing what we're doing because we're able to, to, to impress that upon upon some of these kids. And I wish we could touch more kids. And I hope by doing like the program, I hope we can, even, you know, you set those examples for more kids. I remember coming to the pro and how important that was just to see certain guys play, like even right. Khalid. Yeah. How how Khalid, another high IQ player. Oh, yes. Another guy who could control the game, who got people involved. He was unselfish. Right, yeah. Right, so even. Get a bucket when he needed to. When he needed to. Yeah. But he was more in, interested in controlling the game. Yep. And, and helping his teammates get going. Right. Understanding how to motivate them. How to put them in good positions. So there's certain players and people who understand that, and there's certain people who should be nowhere near telling a kid anything about this game. No. Especially where it is now. It's so advanced. You have so many. My thing is everybody has a position. Some of these program directors and coaches have a talent. And once they understand your talent may be encouraging the kid to do what the hell the coach said do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> what that coach said do, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure you're doing what that because you have a some 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 guys are great encouragers, great motivators. Yeah. Be that. Yeah. You're not a teacher of this game. Because this game. Everything comes with experience. Yeah. I'm not taking my kid to a person who, if he has a situation physically, I'm not taking him to a person who is going to go to YouTube to learn how to operate on my son's heart. Right. (laughs) Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's the same thing with sports. When your kid's game is sick, you take them to somebody who knows the 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 medication to give them. Come on. And then you have to take that medication nightly or daily. You don't get medication from a doctor. They don't they don't prescribe you a prescription. And then you get it and then you go home and then you don't take it. Cause what's gonna happen? You'll get sicker. Right. You're not gonna get healed. Right. And that's what's happening now is Bro, I've been in I've been in workout sessions. Like like you'll bring Lil Royce over to me sometimes mm-hmm. and be like, "Hey, work out with him." Mm-hmm. And you'll sit down and you'll just be watch. Mm-hmm. I'd have been in workout sessions where people pay me money <laughs> to work their kid out, and we get in the session, they coaching their kid while I'm working them out. And I'm like, "This, well, you shouldn't even brought them to me if you." <laughs> You might as well just go ahead and do it. Why you want to do it? Why are you paying me? Paying Why me money? you paying me and you sitting there? Oh man, coaching them. That is hilarious, man. And yeah, it, you know it's 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 funny. It's funny because you sit on the sideline and it's like you just hear what people. You just start to hear how people have no clue what's going on. And what I start to think about the most, and to to, to wrap it up, I want to bring you back next week. We got to yeah. do it part two next week. Yeah, we'll do it part two next week. Um. Uh, and thank you for being here. But what I start to think about the most is is I'm actually having fun. I, hey, I'm actually having fun because I would have been at home. Is my wife gonna hear this? Yeah, I think she will. Okay, so I ain't gonna say. It. Okay, good. Dude, don't say I, that. Because I could come here every yeah, day. Put you in the dollhouse. Because I could come here every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> Sam, <laughs> just a McAllen talking. Just just let just just let it be. Um, now what I start to think about uh, at the end of the day is like how 
for me, like politically in basketball, because basketball is second nature. I've been doing it since I was five. You've been doing it since you was young. Yeah. And both of us, I, I know your your road is even harder than mine in terms of being undersized, being undrafted, coming from a small town, a mm-hmm. town even small piece of shit. Minneapolis was small when I was coming up still. Right. So I could imagine what coming from Carbondale was like then. Right. You know, um, and but having to work hard to actually get to where you got to. Right. And and myself included, like coming from Minneapolis in the Midwest, all of the big notoriety was on the coast. All of the big uh, scouting services were located on the coast and, mm-hmm. and in the Meccas, New York, Los Chicago. Angeles, Chicago, yeah. Texas, right, Florida. Right. right? Uh, and, and New York kind of had that DMV and Philly stuff connected to it too. But even Virginia, Virginia was all connected up that coast up to New York, from New York down to, to Virginia. But, um, you know, having to work, like having to be tougher, Right. Having to know the game, having to understand the game, having to outsmart people, having to have better footwork sometimes. Yeah. Right. Having to be obsessed with the details. Mm -hmm. And I think about these parents and I think I can tell that they're really obsessed with basketball. Yeah. Like obsessed, but not paying attention to the details. That's what it is. So I can tell, like, if it, when it comes to politics, it's part of the reason I joined politics is from my understanding of sports. I was in the sports world, or I'm in the sports world, and I realized how uh, uh, consumed people are with sports. Right. But still don't know about the details. Exactly. Imagine everything else in their life. Imagine politics. Right. Yeah, I'm sure people got an opinion about politics and have no clue what no, they're talking no, about. Exactly. Because you actually... You actually think your kid should be pushing the ball, dribbling the ball when he should be passing the ball. Right. And this is the and people's whole lives, family lives, yeah. are centered around their kids' sports. Yes. The whole the whole week. The the whole week. The whole year. Yes. Shit. The whole year is centered around their kids' sports. Yes. I tell Lil I told, you know, I told Lil Russ the other day we was coming home from the gym. Mm-hmm. You remember I kicked him out of practice. Yeah. Uh, we was in the gym. This was just Tuesday night. And uh, I told him to sprint, and he jogged. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm like, if you think I'm, if you're so stupid that you think you could run the same speed and I can't see you, you're you, you're having trouble. You, you got maturity issues. Right. You're being dumb. That's Le- just dumb. At least fight the air. At least make it seem like give me some fight the air. Son. Something. You could be going. To, your legs could be going the same way. You jog the same the way air. with the exact same face. <laughs> I said, get the fuck out of here. Get your shit on and get the fuck out of the gym. Yeah. Right. And uh, I told him, I told him on the way home. I said, I said you, you're not getting it. I said you can go play on another team. Mm-hmm. You can go play for your uncle B's team, the other seventh grade team. You can go play for another program. Yeah. Because my life does not revolve around your seventh grade basketball. I'm doing this because I've done it, and I'm trying to help you because you want to play basketball. Right. And I know what to to help you with if that's what you want to do. But my life doesn't revolve around this. I do radio every day. Right. I do podcasts seen by millions of people every week. Right. My life doesn't revolve around this. Right. Most people in this country is the exact opposite. Increasingly, they're, the, the religion, the altar, the, the, the Sunday service yeah. is youth basketball, is youth sports. Youth sports. Scary, man. Basketball, soccer, hockey. <sighs> Scary. Everything. Scary. And the betting's getting bigger. And the lights are getting bigger and the TV contracts are getting bigger. It's crazy. And everybody thinks they're getting a piece. I, I tell my wife all the time, around 7, 8 o'clock, I don't want to hear nothing about these kids. <laughs> it's me and you time. That's right. I don't want to hear shit about nothing. <laughs> no, I don't want to hear nothing about unchecked. I don't want to hear nothing about none of that. Right. Because <laughs> that's when you start to lose yourself. Right. You know? Right. It, it comes, you got to you gotta turn it off. Like what, uh, what old boy said from the... Uh, Five heartbeat was it five heartbeat? Five heartbeat. office hours. <laughs> That's a classic. My five, office hours. Five heartbeats reference right yeah, there. Yeah, my office hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, man. It's uh well, it was a pleasure having you For in sure. here this week. This yeah. uh this episode, man. I hope all you guys out there enjoyed this this very rare sports edition yeah. of uh of Please Call Me Crazy. And uh the great Troy Hudson, the Laker killer, Minnesota Timberwolf, now giving his time to the youth. Uh, uncheckable to program. Where do they where do they go to get in touch with the program? If people want to donate, people want to they can go contribute. To, they can go to uncheckablesports.com. Mm-hmm. Uh uncheckablesports.com and then all the donate buttons are on there. Donate, email, email numbers. We I mean we we accept we accept any type of donation. Advice donations. If you can give us leads to any other 
organizations that's doing stuff for use all of that you know what i'm saying so we we're, we're open to to pretty much everything to try to to advance the youth sports um uh, in the youth lives not yeah. just sports but like like i said we're trying to really uh encourage the aspect of everything that comes outside of basketball yeah. and sports yeah and, and for all you out there who and this is all say to, to end a lot of people out there i think still you know we we're in such a dire time in the country and in the world politically, you got world war breaking out. I think of it all the time. The other day I was just thinking like, man, we're walking into practice and literally Israel might be loading up the the F the F thirty uh, fives and going to bomb Iran and 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 Russia could respond and we may be in a full blown kinetic nuclear war and here we're going into basketball practice. And, you know, and it is this life. Yeah. You know, that's every that's everybody all across the world. That's what makes war so unnatural. Yeah. It's like we're doing regular stuff that we want that we should be doing, daily. spending time with our family, just daily life, and you got to worry about your entire world being turned upside down by by war. Um, but but I, I stress to people, you think the world's going to change? This is where it's going to change in these gyms, especially people who criticize the black community uh, and, and and young black men and all the trouble we see with young black men, but young men in general, not yes. just young black men. Young men are having big, big problems, whether it's cr- black on black crime, but mm-hmm. in, in the white demographic too, you got uh, a real prevalence of of mental illness and suicide. Yes, uh, White males, I think, commit suicide at a rate three times greater than anybody else in, in the country. So um, this is where the change is going to start is these little platoons, uh, you know, grassroots organizations and sports is one of the last bastions i'm telling you sports is one of the last bastions of of uh of of you know young people being exposed to discipline yes uh you know uh, hard work and that's why i like the uh, diversity of our program you know it's it, and, it, and i say it because it's like you know yeah kids can go to school kids can be involved in extracurricular clubs you know you can be in chess club or whatever you can go to boy scouts or, or whatever but but sports increasingly is going to be that watering hole mm-hmm. where young kids come to learn whatever they're learning outside of school. Yes. And if we don't have good programs and good men to mentor them, there's no way we're going to save this country. No. There's no way we're going to we're going to have a, a, a good a, a good world, a good society going forward. So sports is important. I don't care if you watch the NBA or not. I don't care if you watch professional sports or not. You don't want to give your money, fine. You don't agree with their politics, fine. That's cool. But don't abandon you sports because all your kids play. Yes. And that's what's funny. All about your kids play. All your kids play. Every kid is coming through you sports. Every kid is playing you sports. Yes. So as soon as you start getting high up on that horse and you you abandon you sports, just know that you're leaving the, the, the future of this country uh, to, to misguidance, right? And yeah. Lack of leadership. So. Um, thanks again, Troy, for being here, brother. Love you. Appreciate it. We got to get you in again next week. I want to talk more NBA stories. Yes, I want to talk you guarding Allen Iverson, Michael Ooh, Jordan, yeah. uh, all the stuff you didn't see. I want to hear about the workouts that people didn't see, yeah. uh, that, that weren't videotaped before the Instagram and TikTokification of the internet. Yes, sir. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll do some of that, uh, next week or, or in the near future. Um, for everybody else out there, thanks for being here again for this episode of Please Call Me Crazy. We appreciate your viewership and listenership today and in the future. Um, Tomorrow morning, Saturday, Real America's Voice, 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, the Royce White Show before War Room and and the great Steve Bannon. So we'll see you there. Um, The fight continues, and as always, Godspeed.